Order, please. As with the tradition on Budget Day in this House, with the consent of the House, we will commence with the motion for resolution number 712, respecting the estimates under orders of the day. This means that the daily routine will be delayed until after the response to the budget speech is adjourned and question period will begin one hour after the start of the daily routine. Is it agreed? It is agreed. With that consent, I'll now recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance and Treasury Board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, with your permission, I would like to do a few introductions uh, before we begin. Permission granted. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. In the Speaker's Gallery, in your gallery, we have some folks here today who have uh, agreed to uh, be part of our budget presentation and uh, to allow their name to be uh, used in the budget. And they have come here to show their support. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge those people. Perhaps we could hold our applause until they've all been introduced and then there will be no in interruption during the uh, speech. Uh, Cynthia Dorrington, board chair for the Chamber of Commerce. Sharon Prest, owner uh, and, uh, of the Foundation for Learning. Uh, Crystal Wicks from the Department of uh, Internal Services. Lizanne Turner, executive director from Yarmouth Tri-County Women's. Dr. Kevin Orrell, Senior Medical Director. Uh, uh, Mark uh, Lacouter, Senior uh, Director with CBRM. Uh, Paula Bond, uh, Cassandra Dorrington, and Daryl McPhee, who are also joining us, and uh, they will be mentioned in the speech. There is one more person, not in the speech, but in my heart, my son, Kevin. <laughs> Um, Mr. Speaker, pursuant to the notice of motion given by me on February 28, 2019, and the rules and forms of procedure for the House of Assembly, I have the honour, by command, to present a message from His Honour, the Lieutenant Governor of the Province of Nova Scotia, relating to the estimates of sums required for the service of the province for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2020, which is... I hereby transmit estimates of sums required for the public service for the province of Nova Scotia for the year ending March 31, and in accordance with the Constitution Act of 1867, recommend them, together with the budget address by my Minister of Finance and Treasury Board, and any resolutions or bills necessary or advisable to approve the estimates and implement the budget measures to the House of Assembly. Signed, Arthur J. LeBlanc, Lieutenant Governor. Mr. Speaker, at this time I wish to, number one, table a message from His Honour, the Lieutenant Governor of the province, transmitting the estimates for the consideration of the House, table the estimate books, table a government business plan, table the Crown Corporation's business plans, Table the estimate and Crown Corporation business plan resolutions, deliver my budget speech, and move that the estimate of sums required for the service of the province of the fiscal year ending March 31, 2020, being supply to be granted to Her Majesty and the Crown Corporation business plans to be referred to the Committee of the Whole House on Supply. The estimates are tabled. The Honourable Minister of Finance and Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. It is a privilege to rise in the House today to deliver this government's 2019-20 budget, our fourth consecutive balanced budget. This position creates a strong foundation on, upon which to build, to move our province forward, and to benefit all Nova Scotians. Throughout my remarks today, you will hear three themes. Number one, 
this budget continues to deliver on our plan to strengthen the financial health of the province by balancing our budget. Number two, a balanced budget allows us to invest in new and existing programs and services for Nova Scotians. Number three, a balanced budget creates the right conditions to encourage investment by the private sector and foster strong economic growth. These are the priorities of our government and they reflect what we hear from Nova Scotians. During the pre-budget consultation period, we appreciate that many individuals and organizations responded with their views on the province's finances and their interest in our investments in public service. One organization we hear from regularly is the Halifax Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber has expressed a strong interest in maintaining our fiscal health and in creating an environment conducive to private sector growth, including competitive taxation, immigration attraction, and workforce and training diversity. Today, again, I would like to acknowledge this input from, by welcoming Cynthia Dorrington, Chair of the Halifax Chamber of Commerce. A successful businesswoman in her own right, Cynthia is also the first African Nova Scotian to lead the Chamber's board. Welcome, Cynthia. Thank you for your efforts. The foundation of any budget is its economic assumptions. A panel of experts, including economists from the major national banks in Toronto and universities here in our province, reviewed our economic assumptions, and they concluded that those assumptions were reasonable. The Auditor General raised no matters of concern with regard to our economic assumptions and revenue estimates. I am confident that our assumptions for this budget are sound. Our plan projects a positive position of $33.6 million for this fiscal year and remains balanced throughout the four-year fiscal plan. When we formed government in 2013, the province was facing a deficit of $676.9 million. We understand the limitations that deficit budgets and financial burden impose on governments and on future generations. Deficit budgets limit innovation in programs and services and limit investing in infrastructure. Deficit budgets li limit our ability to manage the cost of unexpected events such as wildfi wildfires, storms, or frost damage to our crops. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, Balanced budgets strengthen our reputation and give businesses the confidence to invest. For these reasons, we committed to a plan of carefully managing provincial spending. In September 2018, Nova Scotia received our highest ever credit rating by Standard & Poor's, putting us among the top four provinces in Canada. They noted that Nova Scotia is expected to fiscally outperform most Canadian provinces over the next two years. <laughs> Moody's, another credit rating agency, affirmed Nova Scotia's AA2 rating and stable outlook in August by saying, and I quote, the governance and management of the province has demonstrated a higher level of internal control and planning relative to past practices and relative to some Canadian peers." End quote. Our 2019-20 capital plan provides for new investments in health care facilities, schools, roads, and other infrastructure. A key measure of fiscal health is the ratio of net debt to GDP. It reflects the ability of the province to pay its debts. The One Nova Scotia Commission set a goal for the province to reach 30% net debt to GDP ratio by 2024. We are trending in the right direction and moving toward that goal. We have reduced our ratio from 38.2% in March of 2014 to 35% last year and now project it to fall to 33.8% by the end of 2019. <laughs> Other indicators are contributing to a positive outlook for this province. Our population has reached its highest level in the history of the province. For the third year in a row, more youth are moving to Nova Scotia than are leaving. 
A record number of immigrants have settled in Nova Scotia. More international students are choosing to study here and stay here after graduation. Exports continue to increase with Nova Scotia seafood reaching an all-time high in 2018 with a value of more than $2 billion. There are now more full-time jobs than at any point in our history. Unemployment figures show the lowest annual average since 1976, with the rate for February 2019 measured at 6.4 per cent. That was the eighth consecutive month our unemployment rate has dropped. This positive outlook builds confidence in our province. Balanced budgets allow us to invest in new and existing programs and services for Nova Scotians. They give the province capacity to invest in major infrastructure projects. First, priority, improving access to health care. Nova Scotians expect us to work together to deliver the health care they deserve. Our province is changing and so are the health care needs of Nova Scotians. Sustainable, effective change takes time, and we are continuing, and we are striving for continuous improvement. Creating a more modern, collaborative, and evidence-based future for healthcare means investing in the next generation of healthcare service delivery. It means making investments to improve access to primary health care, to improve mental health services and supports, and to reduce wait times for critical services. The ongoing development of primary health care teams continues. The Nova Scotia Health Authority is leading those efforts. These teams make it easier for Nova Scotians to see a doctor or other primary care clinician when they need it. An additional $10 million will be invested this year to further de develop collaborative teams. This work, Mr. Speaker, is being supported by our investments in training more health care providers and in doctor recruitment. We created a new nurse practitioner education incentive and are adding 25 more seats at Dalhousie University over two years. This will help ensure we have new and experienced nurse practitioners in our communities. This year, we will also see the 10 family practice residency seats we announced last year open at Dow University Medical School. During the past year, our government has worked with Doctors Nova Scotia to develop new incentives for doctors to take on more patients. In addition to family doctors, our province needs to ensure we train and attract high demand medical specialists such as anesthesiologists and critical care doctors. Our budget provides $2.9 million to open 15 new residency spaces for specialty medical positions at Dow Medical School. This continues to create a greater pool of doctors delivering care to Nova Scotians. <laughs> Recruiting internationally trained doctors is another important part of the recruitment strategy. The new physician immigration stream created last year has helped us recruit 25 doctors to date. The Practice Ready Assessment Program, a new program designed to assess internationally trained doctors, began in February of 2019. With the support from the province, the College of Physicians and Surgeons is now screening candidates into this first group. Since April of 2018, 125 new doctors have started working in communities across the province. 57 family doctors, and 68 specialists. <laughs> Statistics Canada reports that 87% of Nova Scotians are attached to a primary care provider, a family doctor, or a nurse practitioner, ranking the province fourth highest in the country in patient attachment. <laughs> But, Mr. Speaker, we recognize we need to do more. Our sustained recruitment activity is critical as we, like other jurisdictions, continue to face doctors choosing to retire, practice elsewhere, and or practice differently. That is why we are excited about uh, 
and most appreciative of the communities that are getting involved in doctor recruitment. We know that doctors consider many factors when making a decision about where to practice. They are often choosing a way of life for themselves and their families. Now Lunenburg County is one such example. This community organization is working closely with residents, with local doctors, and with local businesses to show potential recruits what kind of lifestyle is possible in their area. Tina Henniger, NOW's coordinator, said, and I quote, we strongly believe groups like ours need to be equal partners in the recruiting work. We know our communities and we know how to connect newcomers in ways that result in successfully landing in a new place. End of quote. Our government not only appreciates the efforts of community groups like this, but we are also supporting those efforts with $200,000 in funding in this budget. We look forward to continuing our work with them on how to best allocate this funding. As orthopedic wait times come down, the quality of life for more Nova Scotians improves. Our commitment to improving access to orthopedic services continues with a $2.2 million additional investment in this budget. Over the past three years, Mr. Speaker, we have invested an additional $39 million, steadily increasing the number of orthopedic surgeons performed in this province. There were 3,933 surgeries completed in 2017-18. Not only have these investments helped us hire more surgeons, they also support a central booking process that makes better use of operating rooms across the province and by pre-rehabilitation services that help patients prepare for a successful surgery. Having access to mental health services and supports is paramount to many Nova Scotians who have a family friend, family member, a friend, a neighbour, or they themselves who may be struggling. This budget builds on the continued growth in funding for mental health and addiction services over the past number of years. Compared with the $261 million spent in 2013-14, this budget now provides $295 million, which includes $11.7 million from the bilateral agreement we negotiated with the federal government. We will support the expansion of the Adolescent Outreach Program, originally called CAPER Base, announced in February. Government is investing close to $1 million each year for 11 new mental health and addiction staff who will support junior high and senior high students. This expansion is in line with Dr. Stan Kucher's report on improving youth mental health. Schools Plus brings mental health and other community support services into our schools in support of young people and their families. The 2019-20 budget invests an additional $1 million to complete the province-wide expansion of Schools Plus. <laughs> Government has provided funding to the Association of Atlantic Universities to implement online mental health tools for universities and community college students. Healthy Minds NS will continue to give students 24-7 access to online peer support and professional telephone counseling and can help connect students to mental health care right on campus. A legacy of this government is our commitment to taking a one-in-a-generation opportunity to improve health care infrastructure. As health care needs change, we must adapt to ensure the buildings and services are coordinated and meeting the needs of people today and for the future. Our government is making an historic investment in health care infrastructure in this province. This year's capital plan includes $157 million to move forward on two significant projects. The QE2 New Generation Project is the largest health care project in Nova Scotia's history. <laughs> 
from new and renovated operating rooms to relocated cancer care services to the construction of new community outpatient centre and more, this project will transform how some of the province's most specialized health services are delivered. This year, the master plan will continue to take shape, preparing for the eventual closure of the aging Centennial and Victoria buildings in Halifax. We are also excited to embark on the revitalization of health care services in Cape Breton Regional Municipality. This is responding to both the community's changing health care needs and the fact that health care infrastructure is aging and needs to be replaced. Dr. Kevin Orrell is the Senior Medical Director for the CBRM Health Care Redevelopment Project. He says that being part of this project is an opportunity to redesign the health care system now and leave a legacy for future generations. <laughs> Dr. Orrell, who is here today and joined by the project senior director, Mark Lecouter, says this about the redevelopment in his home region, and I quote, the people of Cape Breton will have more consistent health care delivery with expanded specialized services, more long-term care beds, and new community health centers that offer the services people need on a daily basis. Newer, more modern facilities will help with recruiting and retraining doctors, retaining doctors. Redesigning the health system in this region is long overdue, and the redevelopment project will modernize health care delivery now and for the future. As the province's end of quote, as the province's second largest acute care hospital, a regional referral and emergency trauma center and an important teaching hospital, the Cape Breton Regional Hospital will undergo significant redevelopment and expansion. New emergency and critical care departments will be built, as well as a new center for cancer care that will be more than double the size of the existing center. Emergency health services will expand at both the Cape Breton Regional Hospital and the Glace Bay Hospital. They will also perform more surgeries and take more inpatients for the region. As well, a new community-based paramedic program for the region will see paramedics supporting the timely discharge of patients to reduce unnecessary hospital stays and trips to the emergency department. This is patient-centered care at its best. Mr. Speaker, new community health centres will be built in North Sydney and New Waterford, replacing ageing buildings that can no longer be upgraded to meet the health care needs of these communities. These new centres will offer day clinics, blood collection and x-ray services, primary health care and mental health and addiction services. With an ageing population, Mr. Speaker, comes a greater demand for home care and long-term care services. To date, our investments in helping Nova Scotians stay longer in their own homes has grown from $212 million in 2013 to $283 million today. And we know, Mr. Speaker, that is the wish of many, and we continue to assist in them in doing that. Eventually, however, Nova Scotians may need the support provided in long-term care setting and we will invest in this area over the coming years. As part of the CBRM infrastructure project, we will open 120 new long-term care beds with 60 bed modern facilities in both North Sydney and New Waterford. We also look forward to moving ahead with adding long-term care beds in Mahone Bay and Matagan as part as part of the planned replacement of existing facilities in those communities. With an investment of $5 million over 1819 and 1920, we will begin to implement the findings of the expert panel on long-term care, released in January. This includes a focus on wound care and service coordination and on staffing complements. 
In 2017, Mr. Speaker, an estimated 2,800 people died of cancer in Nova Scotia, and 6,200 new cases were diagnosed. That is why modernizing and updating cancer care facilities is a key feature in both the QE2 and Cape Breton projects. <laughs> Our overall investments in health and wellness are steadily, have steadily grown as we continue to respond to increased demands in the system. This year, the department's budget is $4.6 billion, an increase of 18.6%, or $728 million increase since 2013. <laughs> Our children of all ages rely on all of us for their safety and well-being, and to help them prepare for their future. Research shows the significant impact early childhood experiences have. We are expanding childcare services across the province and making it more affordable for parents. The province is investing $67 million this year, which includes federal funding. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this means more support for hundreds more children in childcare settings, and for the first time, families will be eligible for a subsidy for part-day programs. In September 2017, government launched the first pre-primary program for four-year-olds. This is a free, play-based program that provides all children an opportunity, regardless of their socioeconomic situation. It provides parents with an option, and it has been well-received across the province. Currently, more than 3,000 four-year-olds and their families are accessing the program in 185 pre-primary classes. With an additional $10.2 million this year, the rollout will continue, and by September of 2020, we anticipate that every four-year-old in Nova Scotia will have access to a free pre-primary early learning opportunity. Early childhood educators are at the heart of quality child care. To expand services in both child care centres and in pre-primary classroom settings, we are dependent on a well-trained workforce. Working together with the Nova Scotia Community College, we have invested $1.5 million over three years to create 135 new seats, and together with private colleges, will graduate up to 162 early childhood educators this year. Mr. Speaker, the diversity of our communities will be better reflected in this workforce. In fact, in the spring of 2019, up to 20 Mi'kmaq early childhood educators will be able to participate in a program that incorporates their language and their culture while they work. We continue to offer bursaries to Nova Scotians from Indigenous, African Nova Scotian, Acadian and Francophone, and immigrant communities who wish to become early childhood educators. Successful applicants, Mr. Speaker, can receive up to $5,500 each year for two years to help cover their cost of tuition, fees, and course materials. We are leading the Nova Scotia public school system through a significant period of reform with a focus on achievement, inclusion, and skill development to help our students be better prepared for the future. $15 million for inclusive education supports last year has meant more on-the-ground resources working directly with students. This investment funded an additional 191 positions, education assistants, parent navigators, autism and behavioral support specialists, school psychologists, and speech-language pathologists. <laughs> Inclusive education continues to be a priority for our government. In 1920, an additional $15 million will be available to address and implement more recommendations from the Commission on Inclusive Education. 
More resources in our schools make a positive difference for our students. For example, program planning specialists provide additional support for students with complex needs, helping them spend more of their days in the classroom, participating and learning alongside of their peers. Over the last two years, we implemented recommendations from the Council to improve classroom conditions, making class sizes smaller by hiring more teachers. Some of the most valuable contributions have been made have been by those of parents who know and understand their children's needs best. And these changes will continue, Mr. Speaker, to have a positive impact on students going forward. The province will also invest $1.4 million to complete the reinstatement of the Reading Recovery Program across the province by September 2019. Since 2013, Mr. Speaker, government has increased the education budget by nearly 30 percent and added 926 new teaching positions and 381 non-teaching student support positions. A total of 1,307 new staff are now working directly with our students. <laughs> Connecting our youth to the future workforce is a responsibility and a priority of our government. We are spending $2 million this year on a new pilot project called Technology Advantage Program, which brings together elements of high school, college, and the IT sector. The province is partnering with NSCC and IBM to offer a unique career-ready program. Graduates of this program will be ready to qualify for jobs with either IBM or other employers in the technology sector. As students move from high school to post-secondary education, many will need financial support. Our investments in student assistance are making higher learning more accessible and more affordable for Nova Scotia students. Our government has created a path to encourage young graduates to pursue, pursue their post-secondary education right here in Nova Scotia. We are doing this by increasing the student assistance non-repayable grant, by establishing a minimum income level of $25,000 before graduates have to begin making loan payments, and by expanding the loan forgiveness program to support more of our graduates. <laughs> Ten universities and a world-class community college with campuses across the province offer quality programs that respond to the needs of industry and lead to long-term, well-paying jobs. This provides graduates with ready access to the training and education needed for a changing world. The Graduate to Opportunity program has been in place for four years. Since its launch in 2015, the program has funded close to 800 full-time positions with 500 different employers. This year, we are providing a new funding program with, for municipalities to create employment in their communities, particularly for youth. With this $500,000 investment, more Nova Scotians can gain valuable work experience while working on community-focused projects. Mr. Speaker, our vision for Nova Scotia includes all of our citizens having the opportunity for success. That means we need to continue to improve diversity in our workplace. Employment rates for underrepresented groups, including Mi'kmaq, Indigenous peoples, and African Nova Scotians, are well below our provincial average, and this is something we want to help change. We enhance the Graduate to Opportunity and Innovate to Opportunity programs with a 10% added incentive to hire individuals from underrepresented communities. More than 150 graduates have been hired with the support of the diversity bonus to date. This year, we will also uh, introduce the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency with, an incre with increases, uh, while will increase its start program. 
to employers who hire apprentices from underrepresented groups, bringing the total amount available from $25,000 to $30,000 over the term of their apprenticeship. In addition, Mr. Speaker, the Connector program is expanding to regions across the province to help more recent graduates and new residents make meaningful connections to the employers and to find jobs in their field. With increased funding over the past two years, government supported over 500 research internships through the MyTax Accelerate program in areas like ocean technology, ICT, agri-food, and seafood. Mr. Speaker, government is a large employer, and we are taking our own advice. From November 2015 to 2018, the province hired more than 2,300 younger workers, and close to one half of them were hired into permanent positions. Last year, we offered work experiences to youth supported by the Department of Community Services. Crystal Wicks took part in the Inspiring Success program, working with the Department of Internal Services. She said, and I quote, this experience has opened a world of opportunities that did not seem possible before. Opportunities that are not only important for my future, but for my children's future as well. I am proud to be a public servant because I am now able to have a positive impact on the processes that have been put in place to protect and grow our communities." End of quote. I I would like to thank Crystal for coming to the host today, and I wish her every success in her future. Mr. Speaker, we want in Nova Scotia that more people, with more people, more prosperity, and better social well-being. That means making the most of our strengths and creating an environment where local businesses can start and grow. It starts with having enough well-educated and skilled people to meet the labor demands. Our work with post-secondary institutions and our apprenticeship programs will help meet that need. So too will our work to attract more skilled immigrants. We are making historic gains on the immigration front. In 2018, we welcomed 5,970 newcomers to Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, these new Canadians are joining communities, starting families, opening businesses, and filling labour gaps. They are staying, and they are building their futures here. In fact, Mr. Speaker, our immigrant retention rate has almost doubled in the last 15 years and now stands at 71 per cent, the highest in our region. Province-wide high-speed internet is vital for today's digital world. Yet we know many people around this province lack access to the speeds, reliability, and bandwidth to fully participate. With this new provincial mandate, Develop Nova Scotia is managing a plan to deliver better access to high-speed internet to underserviced communities across the province. <clears throat> this multi-year initiative will draw on the federal government's investments and other private and public sector sources, including the $193 million from the Nova Scotia Internet Funding Trust. Government established the Fund Trust last year using one-time revenue earned from offshore projects. It is one of the largest per capita investments in internet access of any province in Canada. A request for qualifications has just closed, and a broader call for bids will follow this spring. Develop Nova Scotia expects to see projects begin in some communities in 2019. Government is investing in the places where new ideas can flourish and turn into business ventures like Volta in Halifax, Momentum in Sydney, Mashup Lab in Bridgewater, and Ignite Labs in Yarmouth. 
We supported the construction and programming at the Centre for Ocean Ventures and Entrepreneurship, or COVE, in Dartmouth, and are providing ongoing funding for sandboxes, innovation accelerators, startup competitions, and mentoring programs, helping young companies get their ideas ready for market. <laughs> Government has also worked to increase the venture capital available in the region. Nova Scotia's technology startups have seen an increase in venture capital over the last few years, which includes $30 million in provincial investment for early stage companies. Government will continue to build an environment where local, innovation-driven, high growth businesses can start and grow. This year, we will increase funding for incubators and accelerators by 500,000 for a total of $1.5 million. Mr. Speaker, we continue to see strong relationships forming between government, the private sector, and our universities and community college system. This demonstrates that we have an all-in approach to capitalizing on our regional strengths and that we are using all of our competitive advantages to move forward. Small and medium-sized companies are connecting with experts and researchers at post-secondary institutions through the Productivity and Innovation Voucher Program delivered by NSBI. Research Nova Scotia will formally take shape this year and will build on the work of the $45 million Research Nova Scotia Trust, which to date has funded 53 projects across a range of sectors. Research Nova Scotia will fund research that benefits Nova Scotia citizens and helps attract researchers, helps our researchers attract more funding and hire more young people. Nova Scotia Community College plays a very important role in the unlocking the economic potential in communities throughout Nova Scotia. With 13 campuses, NSCC is modernizing its facilities and delivering training programs that address the workforce needs of businesses in their communities and throughout the province. Expert growth in new and traditional sectors is paramount for the ability to grow our economy. We are investing an additional $850,000 this year to enable NSBI to expand and enhance many of its export development programs in direct support to business. <laughs> Government is pursuing trade opportunities that benefit Nova Scotia business. We are diversifying our trading partners and continually investing in our relationships in the United States, the Asia-Pacific region, and Europe. We also believe in private sector-led growth in our province. The Innovation Equity Corporate Tax Credit will allow companies to make direct equity investments in other small and medium Nova Scotia businesses. We are also encouraging individual Nova Scotians to invest in Nova Scotian enterprises. A new Innovation Equity Personal Tax Credit was, was launched in January, and the tax credit will incent investments in approved companies of up to $250,000. In addition, Mr. Speaker, we are creating another opportunity for investment, the creation of a venture capital tax credit, which encourages individuals and companies to invest in managed funds that support new and growing businesses. In line with changing in line with changes the federal government announced in November, we are providing $60 million for an accelerated capital cost allowance. This tax benefit will help Nova Scotia businesses, including small businesses across the province, by allowing them to write off their capital investments more quickly. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia remains Canada's seafood export leader with more than $2 billion in exports. The province's seafood exports have more than doubled since 2012, when they stood at $922 million. We will ensure our fisheries sector remains prosperous and sustainable for generations with project funding available from the Atlantic Fisheries Fund our provincial investment will total nearly $38 million over the life of the program. 
With Nova Scotia's seafood brand program, we will continue to build on our export success by marketing and delivering premium quality seafood products around the world. We are also making investments to help farmers and producers innovate, grow, and prosper. <clears throat> the Small Farm Acceleration Program is an example of how one of our cost-shared programs with the federal government can help the new generation of farmers grow into commercial status. This program is available to all categories of agri-food producers, including grape growers who see the enormous growth potential in our wine industry. From 2010 to 2017, the area of land under cultivation for grapes almost doubled, and the value of our grape output more than tripled. We are adding $1.7 million to implement recommendations from Professor Leahy's Forest Practices Review. This will help us shift internal and industry practices toward ecological forestry including more silviculture on Crown land. <laughs> Nova Scotia's mining industry is also important to the province's rural economy. The Mineral Resources Development Fund will reach $1.5 million this year, following through on a commitment we made to attract investment and move more projects closer to production. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, tourism touches every corner of our province. It creates opportunities for entrepreneurs, creates year-round and seasonal jobs, and contributes to the province's worldwide reputation as a positive place to visit and to do business. This year, we will see progress on projects that will revitalize our province's most visited and cherished tourism icons. Peggy's Cove, the Halifax Waterfront, the Cabot Trail, the Bay of Fundy, Annapolis Royal, and the Lunenburg Waterfront. In the year ahead, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to invest in the creative sector, seeking opportunities to export our cultural products to markets around the world. We will embark on trade missions to explore business and export opportunities for Nova Scotia's talented artists, musicians, writers, and craft producers. Also this year, with $1.5 million in funding, the Cultural Innovation Fund will support more projects that use creativity and our diverse culture to address complex social issues through art, culture, heritage, and sport. We are also investing in infrastructure projects that help connect more people and businesses to opportunities. The 100 series highways are the backbone of the provincial road network, playing a key role in business, tourism, and our everyday travel. Our multi-year plan to twin and upgrade large sections of highways 101, 103, and 104, to construct a new four-lane Sackville-Bedford-Burnside connector, those are well in hand. These projects, Mr. Speaker, will improve road safety, create jobs and local economic activity, and make it easier for people and products to move across the province. Our work to reduce government red tape, modernize services, and improve our regulatory systems for business is unmatched across the country. Government has surpassed its regulatory burden target of $25 million by more than $9 million and this means that Nova Scotia businesses will save about $34 million each year. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business recently gave Nova Scotia an A grade for its red tape reduction work, up from an A- minus last year and a D grade in 2015. While we have achieved our target, our focus and our work will continue. Firms across the province are investing in their operations and solidifying their future right here in Nova Scotia. Owners of the Rod Hotels are investing almost $7 million to renovate their Colony Harbour Inn and Grand Hotel in Yarmouth, pointing to the ferry service as the reason for that undertaking. <laughs> Thank you.
We launched the new innovation rebate program last spring to encourage businesses to invest in their own operations here at home. Many are in rural Nova Scotia, employing hundreds of Nova Scotians. With the assistance of an innovation re uh, rebate program, Mr. Speaker, we can note the following. AF Terrio and Sun Limited will spend nearly $6.7 million to upgrade its Digby County operation. <laughs> Michelin is advancing a $12 million project to expand its Pictou County site. The Spring Hill-based company Surrett Battery is investing $4.8 million in new technology and equipment to increase its productivity. <laughs> Canadian Maritime Engineering Limited is investing $3.2 million in new infrastructure and equipment at its North Sydney operation. John Ross & Son Limited is expanding its Halifax business with $4.5 million to install a wire and cable recycling plant. This family-based business has facilities in both Truro and Goodwood. With an additional $5 million this year, Mr. Speaker, the Innovation Rebate Program will double so that it can help even more Nova Scotia businesses. A recent survey of leading manufacturers in the Annapolis Valley shows a strong demand for full-time jobs to support the projected growth over the next five years in that area. This is evidence, Mr. Speaker, that the efforts of government and the hard work of Nova Scotians to create the conditions for companies to start, invest, and grow have been effective. Growth in our economy provides government with the means to invest in our people and our communities. Mr. Speaker, we have an ambitious goal for Nova Scotia to become an accessible province by 2030. Nova Scotia will become a more equitable and barrier-free province, a province where everyone has equal opportunity to work and succeed and to contribute to their communities. Achieving this goal will take hard work and cooperation, and government is committed to doing its part. We are investing $1 million again this year in both accessibility grant programs for community buildings and for businesses. <laughs> Foundation for Learning is a local business in the Colchester East Hants area, providing education programs to children with learning disabilities. Owner Sharon Prest received a grant to support the purchase of tablets for her clinical rooms. With these assistive devices, Sharon and her team were able to access several online teaching sites to help improve learning opportunities for their clients. Mr. Speaker, Sharon is here today, and she tells us that students are excited to be able to access learning tools online, and employees are pleased to be able to track their students' learning. <laughs> She said, and I quote, being able to bring technology into our clinical sessions with the use of the tablets we received through the Business Access Ability Grant has opened new doors for our students. There are several online sites that we use on a regular basis, as well as having the students use the tablets as a writing tool. End of quote. Sure. Government is increasing funding for programs that support adults and children with disabilities by $14.2 million. The Disability Support Program provides services to some of the most vulnerable Nova Scotians. This year, an additional $6.6 .6 million is being invested to reflect the increasing cost for these vital services, and $5.1 million for new residential placements for children and youth with disabilities and with complex needs. We will also increase funding for the FLEX in-home support program by $2.5 million to support more people with disabilities who live at home. A total budget of $32.6 million ensures this program grows to meet the specific needs of individuals with disabilities who live at home with their families. 
The efforts of Nova Scotians, supported by government, are shaping the blueprint for the future poverty reduction efforts. Poverty, Mr. Speaker, is not only about income. It is a complex social problem that affects individuals and families in many ways. That is why government is working with communities across Nova Scotia to address the problem. This year, $5 million of our $20 million commitment will be available to community organizations to help address poverty-related challenges. One aspect of this work is the Building Vibrant Communities Grant Program. This program has funded more than 100 projects at the community level so far. As an example, one of the recipients of a Building Vibrant Communities Grant, Yarmouth's Tri-County Women's Centre, launched a project that allows homeowners in the area to get small repair and maintenance work jobs done. Working with the Choice Housing Coalition, the Women's Centre used the grant to partner with a local carpenter and help homeowners cover labour costs. This is an inspiring example of a community rallying together to identify a real need and then helping their own. I would like to thank Lise Ann Turner, the Centre's Executive Director, who has come from Yarmouth to join us today. In recent years, Mr. Speaker, several changes have been implemented to allow Nova Scotians with low incomes achieve greater income security. We have increased the allowable asset levels for both single individuals and families. We have doubled the poverty reduction credit for individuals and couples without children. We have introduced a personal items allowance worth $101 per month to support people temporarily living in homeless shelters and transition houses to help them buy essential items, including those for personal hygiene. We have exempted child maintenance payments from income assistance calculations. We have implemented a new and progressive wage exemption to help people receiving income assistance keep more of the money they earn. We have worked with the Halifax Regional Municipality to provide free bus passes to residents who receive income assistance as well as their, as their spouses. This year, we will build on this work by introducing a standard household rate in January so that people receiving income assistance will get the maximum amount they are eligible for, as well as a rate increase. And Mr. Speaker, we will extend the child maintenance exemption to clients of both Housing Nova Scotia and the Disability Support Program so they no longer have their child maintenance payments calculated as income. We will continue, Mr. Speaker, to invest in affordable housing initiatives so more Nova Scotians will be able to find a good home at a price they can afford. Another $3 million will be invested this year as part of the three-year three plan to create 1,500 new rent supplements and reduce the public housing wait list by 30%. The Down Payment Assistance Pilot Program for first-time home buyers will be established as a permanent initiative. And to date, this program, Mr. Speaker, has helped with the purchase of about 300 homes. We will spend another $7.2 million in major repairs to existing public housing buildings to ensure safe and affordable housing will be available now and in the future. 465,000 dollars will help the Cape Breton Community Housing Association manage a new emergency shelter in Sydney. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we know that more than 25,000 Nova Scotians earn a minimum wage. On April 1, they will see an increase of 55 cents per hour. They will also see an estimated 55 cents per hour increase in each of the next two years. Mr. Speaker, these increases will help these workers better support their families and give predictability to their employers for the next three years. 
Another serious issue in our communities, Mr. Speaker, is domestic violence. It affects many Nova Scotians, and as evidence shows, women are the primary victims. These threats to women's safety can affect their health, their social well-being, their economic well-being, and that of their children and families. This past year, we began our work with community organizations and groups to build a provincial plan to break the harmful cycle of domestic violence. The initiative is called Standing Together, and we will invest $3 million this year to continue their important work. One project receiving both provincial and federal funding will see Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian organizations developing new supports for victims and their families. Government stands with Nova Scotians who are committed to helping prevent sexual violence from happening in this province. Our investments to help prevent sexual violence and in support of those who survive will continue. Government is expanding sexual assault nurse examiner services to Cumberland and Colchester counties this year. Victims throughout Nova Scotia who need treatment and support will continue to receive immediate medical attention in emergency departments, and all victims and health care providers will continue to have 24-7 access to SANE services by phone or in person. Mr. Speaker, we will also continue to provide sexual violence prevention innovation grants that support community groups, including youth and marginalized groups, reaching out to their peers to raise awareness and promote a better understanding of consent. Supporting survivors of sexual violence, a Nova Scotia resource, was created as part of the province's sexual violence strategy. It provides free online training and resources for Nova Scotians to learn more about sexual violence and how to support someone who has survived it. New modules are being developed now and will be rolled out this year. Government will also provide $470,000 in dedicated funding to support the work of the Provincial Sexual Violence Prevention Committee. This committee is working with universities and community college to implement recommendations that will make a positive difference on post-secondary campuses across the province. <laughs> Last year, Mr. Speaker, government launched a five-year action plan to get Nova Scotians moving more and sitting less. With $2.5 million allocated this year, Let's Get Moving Nova Scotia will help create a more active, inclusive, and healthier population across the province. <laughs> to conclude, Mr. Speaker, in 2014, the One Nova Scotia report highlighted the province's economic and demographic challenges. It was a call to action to leverage Nova Scotia's assets, opportunities, and human capital to build a much more positive future. This was a call to leaders in business and labor, to leaders in municipal, provincial, and federal governments, and to leaders in First Nations, post-secondary institutions, the volunteer sector, and our communities. It was a call to work together, Mr. Speaker, with a common plan, and that is what we have done. Government has stood shoulder to shoulder with the private sector and with our communities as we move closer to the new Nova Scotia economy envisioned five years ago. For our part, government has worked to improve our fiscal health and to create the conditions for fostering innovation and economic growth. Our approach has been working. Our population is at an all-time high. Our provincial finances are on a stable footing. Our private sector is innovating and exporting. Our people are learning and working. To return to the themes of this budget address, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to improve the fiscal health of the province. We will continue to invest in the programs, services, and infrastructure that Nova Scotians have told us they need and deserve. We will continue to create the conditions that give the private sector confidence in this province so they are both willing and excited to invest in new and existing businesses. Together with our partners, Mr. Speaker, government has created and continues to create a strong and proud Nova Scotia.
The Honourable Member for Inverness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the uh, Minister for her budget address. She and I have a, a special relationship. <laughs> years ago, she <laughs> years ago she appointed me as her finance critic when we were in opposition together. So. Um, I feel conflicted standing up here, Mr. Speaker. I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> but I have to be professional. And I have to bring a balanced perspective to what we've heard today, Mr. Speaker. Everything sounds so perfect. And I know I was here in the parking lot last night and I was seeing some of the uh, government members going back to their cars, and I can only presume they had just had a briefing on the budget themselves, and were probably pe feeling pretty good about it, and now it's my job to make them feel not so good about it. <laughs> um, a balanced budget can be good, Mr. Speaker, but the question I think that has to be asked, is this government getting the results we need for our money the way they are spending it? They say everything is getting better, but is it? And what about transparency? Uh, we will be doing our best, you know, in response to this budget and in the upcoming budget estimate debates that will be happening here and across the hall, to inject some transparency into what we've heard today. But I must mention a couple of things. Uh, I think about the Public Accounts Committee, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that has been significantly restricted from its ability to go over things like the provincial budget in the months ahead. Uh, that was a decision made by this government and by the members on the committee represented on that committee by the government. And I think it's an unfortunate one. This government says they are transparent, but their actions do not welcome transparency. And I think of another example, the Deloitte report on P3 construction for the new QE2 development. A huge expenditure of provincial taxpayer dollars will soon happen with this project. A report was commissioned by Deloitte to review what would be the best way to go about that expenditure, to build that infrastructure. The government refuses to release the report. It's too important not to be released. And we know, Mr. Speaker, when we look back years ago, it's 20 years ago now, uh, that the Liberal government was at that time trying to build schools in the province. They chose to build them under the P3 model, but failed to properly evaluate at that time if it was a good deal for the taxpayers of the province, for the people of the province. We don't want the same thing to happen with the QE2 redevelopment. So I say release that report be transparent, make sure the government has the confidence of the people that they will undergo this massive expenditure uh, properly and in a way that's going to bring value for Nova Scotians. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, what will people say about this budget? And I can think a few moments ago we were across the hall and the media were asking some questions and one of the questions was to the minister and commented that there seems to be more discussion of what has gone on the past three years than what is going on this year. And I think, Mr. Speaker, what I think that suggests is there is a bit of lack of vision here. And what I also think it suggests, Mr. Speaker, is overall with this budget, is the government is failing to understand that there are things happening out there that it is not addressing. Health care is at the forefront of that. So, Mr. Speaker, if we look at the, uh, <clears throat> if we look at, I think of another thing I was reading, you know, if we look at the, the province from a big picture perspective, uh, I know one Nova Scotia was mentioned by the minister, and I know there's a website that tracks progress. And I'm not going to get into a lot of detail today, but in the budget, you know, we see the government, I think, acknowledging some of the shortcomings, some of the areas where there's no progress being made or limited progress. And I see them throwing out bits of money. We see it in the budget highlights document. But it's not, I don't think, really acknowledging the issues that are out there. And I think 
you know, Mr. Speaker, we can hear a lot of good news and good points coming from the government today, but what is it actually achieving? That's what we can't lose sight of. I think about uh, one of the biggest things that's concerning people in the province today is the future of Northern Pulp. Not a word of it mentioned in the budget, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think about, you know, if, I mean, if Northern Pulp was to close, what would be the impact on the net debt to GDP ratio? You know, the government is continuing to add to the debt, not with the operating part of this budget, but they are continuing to add on the balance sheet of the province some debt. They always point back to the net debt to GDP ratio as the saving grace. In other words, it's okay to keep adding to the debt as long as we continue to have a prosperous economy. But Mr. Speaker, what does it say about the vision of the government when they ignore the issue of what's happening at Northern Pulp right now and the possibility of that mill closing? What is the size of the impact on that province? Mr. Speaker, I would say to you that it is massive. I would say to you that uh, if, it is, if it does happen, it needs to be in these budget projections. <clears throat> Not only uh, you know, for the sake of, of the people involved directly, but for the people of the entire province. Because if we lose, uh, you know, we asked uh, a question today, you know, how big is Northern Pulp? relative to the provincial economy, and we, we heard that you know, all manufacturing in the province is about 7.6% of GDP. Well, that would suggest Northern Pulp could be around 2.5% of GDP. And while that number may seem small, we know to balance a budget, you're getting down well under 1%. And if you start looking at personal income taxes that people who are working in the forestry sector are paying, and corporate taxes that are being paid, uh, those numbers are going to be affected in the budget, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, I point to, um, you know, there's no money in the budget estimated for the Northern Pulp effluent treatment plant. Uh, there's recognition by government that government is liable for that. Um, where is the effluent going to go? It can't go into Boat Harbor, not after 2020. So, Mr. Speaker, where is it going to go? The mill cannot do anything. You can't flick the on switch without a destination for the effluent. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, if, I guess we could take by the budget, by looking at it, that this government expects there is a place for the effluent to go. Uh, because they are not projecting any uh, downfall in the economy with the possible closure of Northern Pulp. Um, there's also... Uh, no estimates in this budget for the years of 2020 to 2030, which the government years ago had promised Northern Pulp they could continue to use Boat Harbor. Uh, so the government could be liable for 10 years of, of lost profits, whatever that is. So Mr. Speaker, this is a significant thing on the minds of many people that is not addressed in this budget, and it has ramifications in the bigger picture. Um, I want to remind people it was not so long ago that HST was increased in the province. There was a 2% a increase in the HST levy, uh, but it actually it worked out to be 25% increase. It was 2% and 8%. And that's bringing in almost another $400 million of extra sales tax each year. And that is extra money this government has that previous governments not so long ago had, did not have. I want to make that point. Um, Mr. Speaker, again, sticking with the bigger picture, uh, if we look in the, in the short-term future of government, we know there's going to be a, a significant turnover over the next number of years with many retirements happening in the civil service, upwards of 25%. This is an opportunity to ensure services are responding to the needs of the public. And it, it begs the question, are people going to be in the right positions to serve the public? I think about uh, pensions, Mr. Speaker. There is, there is nothing about the uh, pensions, public service pensions that remain well under their solvency thresholds uh, for the security of the, those paying into those plans and for those that are drawing from them. So, Mr. Speaker, what will, what will people say about this budget? Mr. Speaker, I think what they're going to say is that nothing has really changed. 
Yes, there are some good things in the budget, but expect more of the same. Um, and I think uh, particularly, you know, health care is something that is, it is the number one issue today. Uh, it's in the news every day. There are personal stories every day. And I'm not seeing anything in this budget that is going to change that. And that's over 40% of the budget, Mr. Speaker. So, I want to make an, another mention as well, Mr. Speaker, because I think this needs to be mentioned is, uh, and you know, maybe this is a bit of history, but I don't want us to forget it. And I think about uh, the capital plan, which was just introduced uh, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, you know, the QE2 redevelopment is in that, a major portion of that plan. And it was not so long ago that the issue of health transfer payments uh, was being discussed in this province. And, uh, for a number of years, we've been getting health transfer payments of almost 6%, Mr. Speaker. And at the time, the, uh, the Trudeau government in Ottawa was saying, you know, isn't it awful that there could be a change in that? Little did we know that once they would be elected, they would move towards tying health transfer payments to the GDP of the country, which is a lot more prudent than we would know Mr. Trudeau to be. Uh, but the net result for us was that our health transfer pay, which is a significant component of our revenues for the budget, have gone from annual 6% increases to about 2% per year increases. <clears throat> so, Mr. Speaker, my point that I want to raise, this government and this Premier, were they fighting to try to keep more health transfer payment money when other provinces were willing to challenge the federal government and stand up to them Nova Scotia was busy stepping off to the side, turning their backs on the other provincial premiers, and signing a deal with Ottawa for less money, okay. Mr. Speaker. Okay. So when we look at something like the QE2 and we think about uh, the federal government does not put federal infrastructure dollars into hospitals, it pays for our health care through these transfer payments, I think there is an opportunity uh, where the premier sealed his fate on that. And instead of putting the interests of our people in this province ahead, he put his political interests ahead with the Liberal Party. And I think because of the size of that expenditure, that is something that it has to be, it has to be mentioned. Mr. Speaker, I want to move on to health. And, you know, I, I want to say something positive about the mental health funding increase in the budget. It's good to see that. We know how important that issue is and how many people it affects and how many families it affects with loved ones. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we were looking at the, at the budget number for mental health, and we believe that mental health should constitute its own department in government. And did you know, Mr. Speaker, that if it did, it would be the seventh largest department in the provincial government? And I think it, it, it needs to have that consideration. It needs to have that focus. And I think that is an opportunity that hopefully will someday be recognized in a future government. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, if we look at health care, I think of the, the opening question that my colleague, the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party, asked to the Premier in his first question period after becoming leader. The question was, Mr. Premier, do you take responsibility for health care? The answer, Mr. Speaker, was essentially no. There was no, yes, I am the leader of the province, yes, I'm going to take responsibility for health care. Mr. Speaker, the answer was not that, which leaves us with the conclusion that it was no. The Premier does not believe he's responsible for health care. And yet, Mr. Speaker, the evidence is everywhere that health care is in crisis. And if the leader of the province does not accept that and does not accept responsibility for that, how can that crisis be fixed? You know, I think probably the sig single biggest failure of this government has been health care. Uh, they made a significant decision to move towards a single health authority. They took on management of the system and they failed. The evidence is everywhere. 
Um, one of the questions I asked today, Mr. Speaker, in aiming to be positive was, are people healthier? And there's a smattering of dollars you know, spent on wellness, I think, Mr. Speaker, in the budget. Uh, but I don't think there's enough. And I, I think that recognizes that the government doesn't have a vision for a healthier population in Nova Scotia. And I think that's a shame, Mr. Speaker, because the public deserves to have a chance to be in a healthier, uh, more, uh, better wellness, Mr. Speaker. The public deserves that. I also want to point to something uh, positive is, is the idea of a national pharmacare plan, something that was announced in the federal budget. And that is something that we are looking towards and looking with the hope that it will bring cost savings to the province uh, so that maybe some of those Department of Health dollars can be saved and directed to other areas. So Mr. Speaker, we know there's nothing in this budget about that, but we know it's still in the planning stages. Um, I also note, you know, there's stories that touch us, and I think if the woman who needs the, needed the lung transplant, and we know that you can't get a lung transplant in Nova Scotia, you have to travel to where they can provide you a lung transplant, which is in Toronto, for anybody in this province. And Mr. Speaker, I was thinking about her today, and uh, while it's not in the budget, I understand there is going to be some measures reflected soon uh, to support people who have to go for lung transplants. And I hope that's the case, uh, because I know for there's been really no change in the monthly uh, amount given to people who go up to Toronto, leave their homes and their mortgage payments, uh, leave their jobs behind, and get $1,500 a month to live somewhere close to the hospital in Toronto, because they need to be there in a hurry if a lung becomes available. So I'm hopeful that the amount will be increased and will be more meaningful, Mr. Speaker. Um, we look at excise tax on cannabis. So the federal government the other day decided, no, they're not going to remove the excise tax on medical cannabis. And it's certainly a, a revenue source for this province. 75% um, of that excise tax comes to the province. And I guess the question has to be asked, um, if this is a medication prescribed by a physician, should it be taxed with an excise tax? I think many people feel that that is wrong, Mr. Speaker. I want to get into some, some other issues here. Um, uh, I don't, and I don't want to forget anything. Um, I want to get into doctors, Mr. Speaker. And who can forget the, the government's commitment before they formed government in the province? saying that there'd be a doctor for every Nova Scotian. Can't get into a doctor in this province. Don't get a doctor now. And yet thousands of Nova Scotians, tens of thousands, quite possibly upwards of 100,000 Nova Scotians do not have a family doctor. And could we trust this government's numbers with their lack of interest and transparency? Oh, boy. Mr. Speaker, I'd advise him not to wind me up today. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, when we talk about doctors, you know, um, we understand there's uh, almost 2,700 uh, doctors in the province, but not all of them are working full time. There's a couple of hundred vacancies, roughly, uh, according to the most recent figures. About half of those are GPs, and about half of them are specialists. Um, there's no increase, really, in this budget, Mr. Speaker, for doctors. Uh, we see an increase in, in the line item of about 1.1%, which, you know, that would scarcely cover inflation. So there's no real change. So it begs the question, uh, does this government want more doctors? I know the Minister of Health always gets up and says, yes, we've got more doctors. We've hired a couple the other day. <laughs> but he fails to include in his statements how many left. So the budget is not telling us and not answering the call for the possibly 100,000 Nova Scotians who want and need a family doctor. So how can we stand here in good conscience and, and pat the government on the back if something so basic is being ignored, Mr. Speaker? And 
The other point I want to mention, you know, the government will say that it is, uh, you know, and this is good news, that, you know, Dalhousie Medical School is going to be opening up uh, 15 new residency spaces for specialty medicine um, and 10 new for family medicine practice. And yes, that's good, Mr. Speaker. But how many international medical graduates do we know, many of them Nova Scotians, who've gone outside of the province, earned their education, they're smart people, Mr. Speaker, how many international medical graduates are essentially being blocked from doing their practicums in this province and from resettling here and helping us to solve our shortage of physicians? And that is a shame, Mr. Speaker. And that is something that needs to be mentioned. And, you know, I think, you know, I, want, I, I asked a doctor about this. You know, I said, you know, maybe Dalhousie, maybe they just want high standards for us. And who could argue with wanting to have doctors that are, you know, the best and the brightest and, 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 the, and the kind of people who, if you come in with a problem, are going to exa exhaust all uh, avenues of thought to, to make a diagnosis and get it right. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, I know when I asked that physician, he said, he told me that some of these schools are great schools. Um, and he knows because he's seeing some of the doctors that they're graduating. Uh, and I can think of a mutual friend myself and the Minister of Education have, uh, who is practicing in Yarmouth, who is, is an excellent doctor. Uh, he is an international medical graduate. And I know him personally since I was probably about six or seven years old. And I can tell you what a wonderful communicator he is. And uh, he, uh, he has a wonderful way with people. And I know he would be a wonderful doctor. So I'm not surprised to hear of another doctor uh, expressing what a good doctor he is. And that is an international medical graduate, Mr. Speaker, who struggled to settle back in this province. Uh, and I can think of others. I can think of another from Waikagama who, uh, who helped my own father out uh, one uh, day when we went down. And, he wasn't feeling well and, and his doctor wasn't available that day and we went down and um, very impressed, Mr. Speaker. So these are quality people. And my concern mm -hmm. with a budget that is not allocating more money for more doctors, it tells me the government doesn't understand or at least doesn't accept that there's a problem, so the problem that there's a shortage of doctors out there. And, you know, I'll talk about... Um, I want to talk about nurses because we know doctors are important, but nurses uh, are a key part of uh, the medical system. You know, um, we see in the budget 130 new nurses. Well, Mr. Speaker, that may be good. You know, um, I asked about. I asked about. Uh, <laughs> I asked, you know, well, what kind of nurses is this going to be? And, you know, there's going to be 48 nurse practitioners. And maybe those nurse practitioners take some of the load off the general practitioners around the province. Uh, we understand there's going to be 48 of them. Uh, I asked, well, how many patients could a nurse practitioner handle? And they said about 800 relative to a typical GP of 1,300 patients. That would be about 61.5%, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so every nurse practitioner can fill about 60% of a, of a GP. Uh, so that would be the equivalent of about 30 doctors there, Mr. Speaker, um, in cases where they can, um, through, what they are, uh, uh, through their medical license, what they are able to address with people who come to see them. Um, that means if there's 130 new nurses and 48 are going to be nurse practitioners, that leaves 82 other nurses, registered nurses. So, Mr. Speaker, you know, that, that can be a good thing until we look at, you know, what does that mean for the system? Just the other day, nurses were essentially told, forget about your vacations this summer. Why would the government, through the health authority, send a message like that out there if there was not a nursing shortage? Mr. Speaker, and I can tell you, you know, if you're told that you can't have a vacation you know, we take these things for granted, Mr. Speaker. Uh, many people in Nova Scotia, you know, they're entitled, they have their vacation uh, benefit that they can take. Uh, many employers recognize the value of vacations. Uh, you know, I even think for nurses, I've heard personal accounts of nurses, you know, 
Uh, many of them are, are women um, who, uh, you know, they may, be, uh, they may be a bridesmaid in a wedding. And it might seem like a small thing, Mr. Speaker, but in the course of a year, if you are standing in the wedding for a good friend of yours and you're not allowed to have the day off, an employer as big as the provincial government and the Department of Health can't allow you to have a day off so that you can attend uh, you know, maybe one of the most important days to you in your year. To me, that shows an employer that doesn't care. That shows an employer that doesn't understand that to have a happy and healthy workplace, and one that's as important as looking after people who are sick, that's an employer that doesn't care or understand that the people working in it need to be supported and need to be given something as basic as some vacation time and some time to have a life outside of work. And that is a failure, Mr. Speaker. And, and what is it going to do for the workplace, for, for nurses, you know, who, if they continue to feel um, strained at work without any release valves for that strain, what is it going to say about the profession and, and how people stay in the profession? and about the future supply of nurses, Mr. Speaker. So I think that is a failure. Um, let's, look at some of the, uh, let's look at some of the conditions, Mr. Speaker, that nurses are, are working in. And I think about, uh, you know, bed sores. What put a face on nursing homes any more than bed sores? How sad it is that there are people out there suffering or have had to suffer with bed sores, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I can tell you, it caught the attention of everybody. And you know, the, the answer really to bed sores, uh, Mr. Speaker, is you need more nurses in the hospital. You know, continuing care assistance. How do you stop bed sores? You have to turn people's bodies so the body isn't resting on the same spot to create the pressure sore. It's not complicated, Mr. Speaker. Now, the government did make an announcement the other day that will hopefully it will help. They're investing in lifts and mattresses to make it easier, and that's important, and that's good, Mr. Speaker. And I know uh, our health critic has raised that as, as an idea for investment. Um, so that's good. But, Mr. Speaker, we're not seeing anything in the budget to address staffing shortages in nursing homes. And we talked about nursing vacation time, you know, and the strain that that places on them. Um, a lot of these nursing homes, Mr. Speaker, uh, don't have full staff compliments when people come to work. And, you know, what does that mean? You know, you have, uh, you know, some nights you might have one continuing care assistant who needs to look after 30 residents. Now, they may be sleeping, Mr. Speaker, uh, but they still need care. Um, during the daytime, there's often uh, one continuing care assistant for every eight residents. Most residents need two people to turn them. So, you know, if you're there for an eight-hour shift and you've got eight people, you can see them each for an hour, but wait a minute, you need two people to turn somebody, so you've got to run off to somebody else's uh, section, to, other, to their uh, patients, and help them with their patients. Mr. Speaker, it, uh, and, and we think about the residents. You know, years ago, people entering the nursing home, if I may say, Mr. Speaker, their, their health condition was, was better. People entering the nursing home system now their health conditions are very grave. They have oftentimes more than one comorbidity. They're dealing with a lot, Mr. Speaker. And because they're dealing with a lot, the people that are helping to care for them are dealing with a lot. And, you know, I think about, um, you know, these residents, they often can't walk or go to the bathroom or feed themselves. Um, and I don't think the government is ensuring I think it's the government's job to ensure there's enough staff on for a shift, Mr. Speaker. And I don't think they're doing that. And that is, uh, you know, again, does the Premier take responsibility for health care? Does the government feel health care is in a crisis? Uh, Bedsource told us that health care was in a crisis. So, you know, there, there is a higher rate of sick days for staff in these institutions. And it's probably because of the conditions they're facing when they're coming in to work their shift. 
Um, and, you know, I would say, you know, some people would say, well, you know, they should be showing up for work. I would tell you, Mr. Speaker, that that is a failure of management. A failure of management. And I want to point, Mr. Speaker, back to the government, because ultimately the government is responsible. Nobody else is accountable, Mr. Speaker, to, to the public any more than this government is. That is the government's problem, and that is the government's problem that they should be trying to solve in this budget. So, Mr. Speaker, you know, when we look at nursing homes and the situations that some of them face, I think this is a failure to care for our moms and our dads and our grandparents, many of them who are the least able to advocate for themselves. And I know, Mr. Speaker, people who have gone into these homes, uh, you know, I'm thinking uh, about a couple who uh, one had, a, had an injury, his health went downhill quickly, uh, another had, uh, had dementia and came on very quickly. And I can tell you in no time at all, Mr. Speaker, they were in the nursing home needing significant care, and I'm sorry to say, but, but they've both passed on. But it just goes to highlight the gravity of the conditions that people are in, and they need help, and they need a government that cares to ensure that the people helping them have help, Mr. Speaker. When we think about nursing homes, Mr. Speaker, there are no new nursing home beds this year. I know that's a question we're all asking, Mr. Speaker. And that, to me, Mr. Speaker, is clear evidence that the government fails to understand the problem with health care. You know, ambulances are backed up because the people they're trying to drop off are already clogging the emergency room beds because the beds in the acute care sector are clogged with people waiting to get into a nursing home, and the nursing home beds are all full. So the government presents us a budget that says there's going to be no new nursing home beds. Is that a solution, Mr. Speaker? Not a chance. Uh, we know there's some beds projected for the future, and I'll mention them in CBRM, 74 new beds, Mahone uh, Bay, 35 new beds, and Acadian, Villa Acadien in Matagan, 10 beds. But Mr. Speaker, they're not coming this year. So, <clears throat> and how is the health authority, and, and you know, again, I want to say this is not the health authority, this is the government. How is the government dealing with this? Well, just last week, we heard them chastise nursing homes for sending their clients to the emergency room. How condescending, Mr. Speaker, when you consider that it essentially suggested that nurses were sending people to the ER and that was inappropriate, Mr. Speaker. Let's consider for a moment, Mr. Speaker, for a nurse in a nursing home to make a diagnosis, uh, they don't have the equipment. Think if somebody was to fall in a nursing home. Uh, does a nurse pick the person up off the ground and say, they're there, that's just a bruise. They don't have an x-ray to determine if they've broken a hip or a, a, a leg bone, Mr. Speaker. You know, if, if a nurse decides, you know, well, that's just a bruise, well, they're putting their license on the line, I think, Mr. Speaker. But more importantly, that person could be suffering with a broken bone. The reason they're sending them to the ER, Mr. Speaker, is because they're concerned about them. They don't have the equipment to make the diagnosis, and oftentimes you need a specialist to make a diagnosis, and that's why they're being sent to the ER. So, you know, I hope that this government hasn't sent a message to nurses and nursing homes, please don't send us anybody, deal with it yourself. Because if they have, Mr. Speaker, the people suffering are going to be the people who are living in the nursing homes. And that is a shame. I also want to say that, you know, sometimes the care plans for these people dictate that they want to be sent to a hospital if something happens to them. That's written right into the care plan, and, th and that's not an option, Mr. Speaker. They have to be taken to the emergency room. So again, you know, I think when the government comes out and says, you know, we've got no new nursing homes in this budget, and by the way, stop sending your clients to the emergency room, that is a failure by this government to understand what's going on in healthcare. So, <clears throat> so, you know, Mr. Speaker, you know, and that's why I've spent a lot of time on health care today, and I, I know the time is moving on. I do want to mention a couple of other things, you know. Um, I think about tourism in the province, you know. 
Uh, we look at the tourism budget, it's the same this year. Uh, but I want to factor into that, Mr. Speaker, you know, the money that's being spent on the, on the ferry. And if we look at really money that's being spent to bring visitors to the province, um, you know, it's a total, uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, of about 41, 42 million dollars a year. Uh, you know, we had 2.4 million people come to the province last year. Uh, 50,000 came by way of the ferry. Yet of the total tourism dollars that we're spending, 46% of the total tourism dollars are being spent on the ferry. You know, so, you know, we have to, we have to ensure that we're bringing people through the province, Mr. Speaker. But, you know, if the government is going to be spending money, they should be asking themselves these questions. And they should be coming back to Nova Scotians with plans that are doing the best they can for people, Mr. Speaker. And to just blindly uh, to say, you know, no, some people in the House don't support the ferry, that is, to me, Mr. Speaker, that does a disservice to the concerns that are being raised. So, Mr. Speaker, um, you know, once again, at if, you know, 46% of the tourism dollars are being Order, spent. please. The Honourable Member for Inverness has the floor. It's, it's, I'll be very genuine, Mr. Speaker, if there's such a word, Mr. Speaker. I'll be very genuine. <laughs> In response to that I might be disingenuous, Mr. Speaker, the fact is, you know, the government is spending 46% of the tourism dollars to bring in 50,000 visitors, and the other 54% is going to just bring in the other 2.3 million visitors. So that's math, it's accurate, it's accurate as of today, according to the government's own officials, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, is the government uh, interested in politics or are they interested in bringing people to the province? And, you know, we see people in, in the budget that are investing in tourism in that area, and that's great, but what about the people that are investing in tourism all over the province? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I think about education, and I want, I want to say something positive for the Minister of Education here. <laughs> it's kind of ironic that that was my next point. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, you know, I see one of the big issues that we've championed in this legislature is, is uh, what's happening in the classroom, you know, and we're concerned about students who have learning difficulties who have to wait months to get assessed and to get their help, Mr. Speaker, so that, you know, the years don't go by and they find themselves advanced through the education system until it's, you know, to the point of it being too late uh, and they didn't get the help they needed when they did need it. You know, so we're seeing the government invest $15 million more dollars. <laughs> We hope this will help, uh, but I did ask the question today, Mr. Speaker, you know, how many children do they think this will help, and no estimate could be provided. Um, public housing, and you know, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to close with this one, one story. Um, you know, there's some new money for public housing, $7.2 million for uh, public housing uh, units, and uh, about a million for this year for rent supplements for where they usually partner with, with private individuals to build affordable housing, Mr. Speaker. Now, I know there's, there's three projects in my own constituency right now, Mr. Speaker, that, you know, they've been turned down, and I hope it's not for anything I've said today. Uh, but I want to be serious, Mr. Speaker, because this money matters. And it's one thing for the government to pat itself on the back for saying, you know, look what we're doing for affordable housing. But I bring you back to the question I asked at the start of my remarks, you know, is the money being spent in such a way that it's making a difference? And I want to tell you a story about a constituent of mine, Mr. Speaker, in Inverness. A single mom um, who last fall um, said, you know, I have a place, I have a place to stay for the winter. Uh, but we know, Mr. Speaker, with Airbnb, many housing <coughs> units are being taken off the market. People are renting them in the summertime uh, and making more money renting them to visitors. It's removed a lot of housing from the affordable housing marketplace. So, Mr. Speaker, this individual spent the winter hoping that housing would find her a place to stay in Inverness. Do you know why, Mr. Speaker? Because she has employment in Inverness. 
She's found a job. She's working. That small business needs her, Mr. Speaker. To keep going, that business needs people to work. They have somebody who's a good worker. Her daughter's going to school, Mr. Speaker. She has friends at school. Unfortunately, just the other day, I learned that she has been told there is no housing for you in Inverness. The closest option was Port Hawkesbury, which is an hour away. Not very nice, Mr. Speaker. So for a system that is supposed to work for people, and for somebody like this who has found employment, and for her daughter who's going to school to be told that their lives are going to be turned upside down because in six months no affordable housing could be found for them in their community. I think that's a shame, Mr. Speaker, and I think it's a sign that while the government can say they're spending money in helping people, they're failing to deliver the results. So, Mr. Speaker, you know, it's not about how much money is being spent. It is about how it is being spent, how effectively, and what is the result. And I don't believe, Mr. Speaker, this government is getting the job done, and particularly with health care, because I don't think they recognize what's happening in health care. I think they're ignoring it. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I will adjourn debate. The motion is to adjourn debate on the budget address. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. We'll now move on to the daily routine. We'll begin the daily routine with presenting and reading of petitions. Presenting reports of committees. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee on Law Amendments, I'm directed to report that the Committee has met and considered the following bills. Bill number 103, an act to amend <coughs> Chapter 244 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Justice of the Peace Act. Bill number 105, an act to amend Chapter 40 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Judicature Act. Bill number 106, an act respecting coastal protection in Nova Scotia. Bill 109, an act to amend Chapter 41 of the Acts of 2011, the Pension Benefits Act. Bill number 112, an act to amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act, respecting student protection. And Bill number 116, an act to provide for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity in Nova Scotia. The committee recommends these bills with the favourable consideration of the House without amendments. Ordered that these bills be referred to the Committee of the Whole House on Bills. Tabling reports, regulations and other papers. As Speaker of the House of Assembly and pursuant to subsection 18.4 of the Auditor General Act, I'm pleased to table the report of the Auditor General to the Nova Scotia House of Assembly entitled Follow-up of 2015 and 2016 Recommendations. The report is tabled. Statements by Ministers. Government notices of motion. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas March 27 marks World Theatre Day, on which we recognize the power of theatre and a bridge builder for mutual international understanding and peace. And whereas in Nova Scotia, theatre plays a valuable and important role in our arts community and has a tremendous impact on our overall culture and heritage. And whereas theatre is not only important from a cultural aspect, but it also brings economic opportunities to our communities across Nova Scotia and Canada. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House recognize March 27th as World Theatre Day and the important role theatre plays in communities across Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. 
The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Uh, joining us here today in the East Gallery are Debbie Tobin, the Executive Director of the Epilepsy Association of Nova Scotia, and Linda Rideout, the Purple Day Coordinator for Nova Scotia, and I believe Cindy uh, McLeod may also uh, be here with us uh, too, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd ask that all members uh, join me in giving them a warm welcome of the heart. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas epilepsy is a common neurological condition that affects 50 million people across the world, and whereas groups like the Epilepsy Association of Nova Scotia are working hard to support people living with epilepsy through education programs and advocacy, and whereas March 26 is Purple Day, a day to wear purple to increase awareness of epilepsy, therefore be it resolved that all members of this legislature show their support for people living with epilepsy by wearing purple. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Aquaculture and Fisheries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice on a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas through the hard work of industry, Nova Scotia remains Canada's seafood export leader. With more than $2 billion in exports, 29% of Canada's total seafood exports. Whereas our industry members once again displayed their level of competence into reaching out to new levels of success by participating in North America's largest seafood show, the Boston Seafood Expo held on March 17th and 19th. A total of 60 Nova Scotia companies, including seafood processors, buyers, service providers, harvesters, and logistics companies participated in the show to help promote their business and sales. 19 Nova Scotia companies participated as exhibitors. Whereas the industry's strong participation at the seafood show speaks to the level of dedication that this industry has grown in the value of seaport, uh, seafood exports for the benefit of the economies of our coastal communities and rural communities. Therefore, we resolve that all members of this House join me in thanking our seafood industry members for their hard work and continued commitment to growing Nova Scotia's <coughs> seafood industry and to the jobs and economic activities it creates in Nova Scotia. Would the Honourable Minister like to request waiver? Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd request waiver notice and pass it out debate. There is a request for waiver. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas March 21st was the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination with the theme Mitigating and Countering Rising Nationalist Populism and Extreme Supremacist Ideologies. And whereas the day commemorated the 69 lives lost in the year 1960 after South African police opened fire on unarmed black South Africans who were peace, peacefully protesting the apartheid pass laws in Sharpeville, South Africa, and whereas our government is committed to addressing systemic racism and discrimination and supports individuals from all cultures and races striving for full inclusion in all aspects of society. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the House of Assembly join me in recognizing March 21, 2019 as the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and stand up against racial prejudice and intolerant attitudes which impact millions of people around the world. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. But all those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Minister of Lands and Forestry. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the United Nations proclaim March 21st as International Day of Forest to celebrate the importance of all types of forest, and whereas the theme for 2019, Forests and Education, is helping our children become aware of the benefits of trees and forests and the need to manage them sustainably, and whereas the sustained health of our forests and related biodiversity is vital to our economy, culture, traditions, and history, and to our future, Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the House of Assembly celebrate March 21st as International Day of the Forest and recognize the opportunities to teach our children about the importance of healthy forests. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. <clears throat> we'll now move on to introduction of bills. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I wish to introduce a bill uh, entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 211 of the Acts of 1904, an act to incorporate the Pine Grove Cemetery Company, Lower Stewiak, Colchester County. <laughs> The Honourable Member <coughs> excuse me, for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 211 of the Acts of 1904, an act to incorporate the Pine Grove Cemetery Company of Lower Stewiak, Colchester County. <coughs> bill number 122 entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 211 of the Acts of 1904, an act to incorporate the Pine Grove Cemetery Company, Lower Stewiak, Colchester County. Order, <clears throat> ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 31 of the Acts of 1996, the Sales Tax Act. <clears throat> The Honourable Leader, House Leader for the New Democratic Party begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 31 of the Acts of 1996, the Sales Tax Act. Bill number 123 entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 31 of the Acts of 1996, the Sales Tax Act. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. <clears throat> The Honourable Member for Truro Bible Hill Millbrook Salmon River. Thank you, Ms. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce an act entitled "An Act to Amend Chapter 25 of the Acts of 1998, the Real Estate Appraisers Act, and the Election by Widow Regulations." Thank you. The Honourable Member for Truro Bible Hill Millbrook Salmon River begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 25 of the Acts of 1998, the Real Estate Appraisers Act and the Election by Widow Regulations. Bill number 124 entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 25 of the Acts of 1998, the Real Estate Appraisers Act and the Elections by Widow Regulations. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. <clears throat> Just before we move on to the next item, uh, for those keeping track, question period will start at two. Uh, pardon me, 3:56 p.m. 3:56 p.m. We'll now move on to notices of motion. Statements by members. The honourable member for Pictou West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I see many of us in the chamber today are wearing purple, and I chose to wear the purple ribbon today to promote and recognize March 26, 2019 as Purple Day. Purple Day began in 2008 with one woman. She struggled with epilepsy and wanted to dispel myths and have people come together to realize they are not alone in their struggle. Now Purple Day has become an international day of recognition. Our local chapter, the Epilepsy Association of Nova Scotia, works diligently to spread awareness. 
Epilepsy affects over 50 million people globally, with half of the cases not having a discernible cause. Epilepsy is not a disease, it is a disorder. And at this time, there is no cure. However, there are ways to manage it. I hope that all members of the House of Assembly take time out today to donate to this wonderful cause. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize and congratulate Lisa Wolf on her retirement as director of the Ross Farm Museum. Lisa's tenure with Ross Farm began in 2000, and she's played a leading role in the museum's growth over the years. For the past 19 years, Lisa has led this internationally acclaimed, locally managed provincial museum that celebrates the rich agricultural and woodlot culture and heritage of rural Nova Scotia. Lisa recently guided the creation of Ross Farm Learning Centre. This important new community asset extends Ross Farm's ability to share the core values of our rural heritage skills. Lisa has also served on the Chester St. Margaret's Tourism Support Network, lending her expertise and experience to other members as we create true year-round rural destinations and experiences for Nova Scotians and visitors. Mr. Speaker, I invite the members of the Assembly to congratulate Lisa on her successful years with the Ross Farm and Museum and to wish her well in her retirement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to bring recognition to CTV's Ron Shaw. Ron has recently retired after 45 years of service of broadcasting news. After studying broadcast journalism at Fanshawe College in London, Ontario, Ron held various positions around Canada before settling in the Maritimes. Ron has retired from CTV, but not from life, and plans on following other endeavours. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in thanking Ron Shaw for his exceptional broadcasting service over the past 45 years. His dedication and hard work have not gone unnoticed. We look forward to what the future will bring for him. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, relocalizing economies and circular economies, these are terms that captured the transformation of our, our economic life that will be essential to avert the worst of catastrophic climate change. Investing in food security, local food procurement, import replacement, community-owned energy generation, active transportation and public transportation, these are some of the items that might appear in such a forward-looking budget. I don't have an electronic copy of the budget address, so I can't do a word search, but neither my ears nor my eyes picked up the terms climate change in the budget address. There are many issues with this budget, and I look forward to parsing and debating them all. But today, keeping with my resolution to talk about climate change in this House, I want to mention just that one. Thank you. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. And Mr. Speaker, on March 23rd, tragedy struck the Bryan family. In the early hours of March 23rd, a car accident took the lives of three people in Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, my heart goes out to all the families impacted, especially the Bryans. April and Andrew lost their son, RJ, that night. RJ was a loving father of one-year-old son, Jackson, brother, of six, er, brother to six siblings, and loving son. Mr. Speaker, my heart goes out to the, their son, Jackson, his parents, April and Andrew, and all his friends, brothers and sisters. May he rest in peace. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Escazoni Junior Eagles have just completed their expansion season in what is now the 12-team Nova Scotia Junior Hockey League. The Eagles were granted their franchise rights at a league meeting in Pictou on February 2018 and never looked back. The club finished their inaugural season with a record of eight wins, 23 losses, and one overtime loss under head coach Matthew Gould and assistant coach and GM Levi Denny. They were led by players such as Thomas Noel Simon, Jacob Denny, Ryan Lettuce, and Brody Dawson. The team executive includes President Leroy Denny, Vice President Dion Denny, Treasurer John T. Johnson, Secretary Alicia Jador, Statistician Richard Stevens, and Director of Hockey Operations Chuck Gould. Mr. Speaker, they may not have made the playoffs in their opening season, but with a dedicated team of players and executive members, there's not a doubt in my mind they will be competing for a Nova Scotia Junior Championship in the not-too-distant future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg.
Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the staff and students of New Germany Elementary and Regional High School who have come together to support community members in need. Families are able to access donated non-perishable food items, personal hygiene products, and gently used clothing free of charge through essential lockers set up in both schools. In the high school, there is a dedicated space which is known as the free store. This space allows for users of the store to enter through a separate entrance to improve confidentialities. Families and students are able to access the store and take what they need. On February 15th, the principal for New Germany High School, Jennifer McMullen, gave me a tour of the free store, and I was able to learn more about this incredible, incredible initiative and give a donation as well. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that you and all members of this House of Assembly to please join me in recognizing both New Germany Elementary and Regional High Schools on their efforts to help families in their community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Picto Centre. Mr. Speaker, Pictou County Roots for Youth recently enjoyed their annual Cola's Night of the Year fundraiser walk to assist and raise funds for their valuable facilities. The event was held on February 23rd in Glasgow. It is organized by the staff and board members of the Roots House. Each year, over 300 walkers collect pledges and set off to walk up to 10 kilometers, all for the purpose of raising money and awareness of youth homelessness. The the annual event is a fun, feel-good, family-orientated event that allows the facility to keep their doors open for at-risk youth in the area. The event raised approximately $46,000 last year. Their 2019 goal hoped to raise $50,000. On behalf of all members of this legislature, I extend my congratulations to all organizers of this event. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Violet Rosengarten, a resident of Dartmouth North, on the opening of her new art exhibition. Titled Violet Rosengarten's Spring Collection, Foliage, Flowers, Foliage and Flowers, Islands, Lakes and Seas, the collection features many plein air paintings of landscapes throughout Nova Scotia that are layered with acrylics, oil stick and oils, a combination that creates textured paintings that are beautiful and abstract. When creating these works, Violet paints quickly in order to capture the movement of a landscape, clouds, trees, and shifting tides. She describes the process as thrilling and exhilarating, and this is captured in her work. Violet Rosengarten began her artistic career as a textile artist, and after graduating from Concordia with a BFA, she turned to painting. She has worked as an artist and also as a public school teacher. She's a passionate environmentalist and a very talented painter, and I ask the House to join me in congratulating her on her new collection. Thank you. The member for Clayton Park West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to make a second introduction for somebody who has already been introduced by the Minister of Health and Wellness. Um, Debbie Tobin is a constituent of mine, and she is here for Purple Day Epilepsy, and I have a member statement for her for a second. Mr. Speaker, on, Ep on uh, Purple Day Ep for Epilepsy, I would like to introduce you to a woman who has been a lifetime advocate for those living with disability. In my writing and beyond, Debbie Tobin serves as Executive Director of the Epilepsy Association of Nova Scotia and volunteers over 15 hours per week. She facilitates and prepares for the annual members' Christmas dinner, summer picnic, and Purple Day Gala. Debbie has also volunteered for CNIB, Scouts Canada, East Novability, West Bay Road Volunteer Fire Department, and Island Community Justice. Debbie has also acted as the Director of Inverness and Richmond Society for Persons with Disability, and as, a, as the manager of the Naomi Society for Victims of Violence. Many things, Mr. Speaker. She also plans to do some volunteer work for the Unicorn Theatre soon. Mr. Speaker, would this House of Assembly join me in applauding Ms. Tobin for always giving back to her community and advocating for those without a voice. Thank you so much. The member for Sackville Beaverbank. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to rise today to acknowledge Shayla Skinner. On February 9th of 2019, during a Metro basketball playoff, the grade eight Sackville Heights Junior High student scored the winning basket in a championship game against the Coal Harbor Rockets. Mr. Speaker, Shayla has been playing for the girls U14 division for the past 
two years, and the 13-year-old forward from Sackville Storms had only six seconds left in the game with her team down by two points. She made a three-point shot to win, just beating the buzzer. I'd like to take an opportunity to wish Shayla and all the members of her team congratulations and great success in the future. The member for Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Yarmouth and Area Chamber of Commerce celebrated our local business community at its 2018 Business Awards, and the Customer Service of the Year Award was won by Sylvia Dalton. Sylvia is a master esthetician at Polished and Wrapped in Yarmouth, where she has a large and loyal clientele and offers a full slate of spa services, including facials, oxygen bar, and aromatherapy, to name a few. I ask this House to join me in congratulating Yarmouth Sylvia Dalton on winning the Yarmouth and Area Chamber of Commerce Customer Service of the Year Award and wish her continued success. The member for Sydney River Meyer Lewisburg. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate two young dart shooters from Gabrus Lake who recently participated in the Nova Scotia Youth Dart Provincials held in Bedford. J.T. Martel captured the Nova Scotia Senior Boys Provincial title, while his sister Brooke Martel finished second in the Junior Girls Division. J.T. and Brooke are the son and daughter of Arthur and Beth Martel of Gabrus Lake. J.T. and Brooke will represent Nova Scotia at the Canadian Dart Nationals in May in Saskatoon. Mr. Speaker, I stand today to acknowledge J.T. and Brooke and wish them the very best in Saskatoon as they go forward in their endeavours. Mr. Speaker, once again, I'm very proud to congratulate my neighbours, JT and Brooke Martell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Bedford. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to congratulate Thai Ivory Cuisine in Bedford on being the first Thai restaurant in Nova Scotia to receive the Thai Select Award. The Thai government set up the Thai Select program to encourage high quality in restaurants that serve Thai food. Thai Select restaurants are classified by the use of Thai ingredients, cooking method, and the authenticity of flavors. The designation lets patrons know they will experience an authentic Thai cuisine. Currently, more than 1,000 restaurants around the world have received the certification. In Canada, roughly 100 have been so designated. I'd like to congratulate the owners and staff of Thai Ivory Cuisine in Bedford on their certification in 2018, and I can attest to my fellow members that the food there is indeed delicious. Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on March the 6th, I rose to wish Ben Terrio success as he headed to Abu Dhabi for the 2019 Special Olympics World Summer Games, and success he found. One of only six Nova Scotian athletes on Team Canada, Ben came home wearing three medals, fifth place and a personal best in the 200 meter, seventh place in the 100 meter, and fifth place in the four by 400 meter relay. It goes without saying that all of Queen's County is absolutely beaming with pride for Ben. He has certainly shown us all that great results come from sheer hard work and determination. Mr. Speaker, I would invite all members of this House to join me in congratulating Ben on his performance. Ben, thank you for being a true ambassador for Nova Scotia and for Canada on the world athletic stage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Preston Dartmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we'd like to recognize Mr. Ross Simmons of Preston, who has a lot of offering businesses. He wrote uh, Stand Up, uh, the content guide, content guide for entrepreneurs, and the Hustle Manifesto. He started his career blogging about video games, which evolved into marketing under Hustle and Grind Banner, that he has attached a large global audience. When business wants to connect with a new client, they contact Mr. Simmons, who helps them understand what the customer want and how that aligns with their, their company's identity. I want to recognize and congratulate Mr. Ross Simmons for his valuable contribution to the business community of Nova Scotia. The member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to salute CBU, Angela, CBU student Angela Rotterham. In her community studies program, she realized the importance of her community. Angela started visiting local beaches and parks, picking up 15 to 16 needles from the previous night's activities. She then worked with community groups to obtain a sharps bin at the cost of $3,000, which took her about a week and a half. 
The alley centre of Cape Breton will empty and maintain the drop-off bin. Now needles and other things related to drug use can be safely disposed. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Angela and her community partners for her initiative. Angela, Angela can still be found cleaning local parks and beaches at 5.30 a.m. most mornings to make our community safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Claire Digby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to remember a special lady, Regina DeVoe, an active force in her community and an avid volunteer. Regina grew up in Cape St. Mary, and after a short time away, she returned to the home she loved to raise her children. Through the years, she volunteered in her community and at her church, and she was always ready to help her neighbors. If you asked Regina what her passions were, she would have included supporting the Liberal Party. First volunteering as a poll captain in 1957, she would be a force in the party from that point on. Even in the last years of her health waning, she would go to campaign rallies when possible and telephone people to inform them of upcoming debates or get-togethers. Regina also worked as an assistant to two MPs, Colleen Campbell and Harry Varon, and was recognized as West Nova Liberals Liberal of the Year in 2007. My condolences to her husband, Antoine, and her sons, Roland and Dale. She will be missed by her large circle of friends. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to recognize the work being accomplished by a community television station located in Arishat. Talil Community TV was established in 1994 as a result of retraining efforts brought on by the collapse of the Atlantic cod fishery and as a means of communication within the community. Mr. Speaker, Talil is operated by a board of directors which employs three full-time staff members as well as summer students and other short-term employees. The station has a reach from Lewisburg to Port Hawkesbury and is also carried on satellite signal across Canada. Recently, the station has undergone upgrades to allow it to record and broadcast in a digital format, producing a clearer and crisper broadcast to its viewers. Mr. Speaker, I ask this House to join me in congratulating the board and staff of Tell Ill on their recent upgrades and for the informative and valuable service they provide to the people of Cape Breton, Richmond and the and the broader public. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Guysborough Eastern Shore, Trackety. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Helping the Helpers is an organization dedicated to the education and awareness of PTSD with a focus on frontline professionals, and each year they award their Helping the Helpers scholarship to one deserving candidate. This year, Madison Harple of Indian Harbor Lake, a student in her first year of nursing at Dalhousie University, is the worthy recipient. Madison was chosen for the award because of her work with the St. Mary's Academy Healthy Active Lifestyle Team, bringing attention to PTSD through mental health awareness events. Madison stresses the importance of having PTSD supports and education for nurses because, quote, they not only deal with patients suffering from PTSD, but they are also very susceptible to it themselves, end quote. Mr. Speaker, Madison's mother, Amy, is a highly regarded LPN in the St. Martha's Regional Hospital Daycare Surgery Department, and I have no doubt in my mind that Madison herself will garner the same esteem throughout her career. Congratulations, Madison. I wish you much success. Member Dartmouth East on an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Duxch Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the West Gallery, we have Alex Kronstein, a Dartmouth resident and a contributing writer to the Nova Scotia Advocate. Uh, just the other day, Mr. Speaker, uh, Alex was in my constituency office and he showed me the neurodiversity flag that he's going to be uh, raising at uh, Halifax City Hall at Grand Parade on uh, March 29th. So I ask uh, the House to give Alex a warm uh, welcome to the House of Assembly. Member for Cumberland North. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to bring awareness to Purple Day for epilepsy. It is estimated that one in 100 people and over 300,000 Canadians have epilepsy. Many of the times the cause is unknown. Epilepsy is a neurological disorder of the central nervous system, specifically of the brain. It's characterized by the tendency to have recurrent seizures. It is not a disease, it is not contagious, and it is not a psychological disorder. We should be educated on how to assist anyone who may have a seizure in order to ensure the safety of our loved ones, friends, and colleagues. There is currently no cure for epilepsy. 
I would like to make special mention, Mr. Speaker, of a beautiful hearted woman, Crystal Angus Smith. She had recurrent seizures and passed away at the young age of 43 back in 2015. Mr. Speaker, today I wear purple to bring awareness to those living with epilepsy and to make sure that no one is alone in this journey. The member for Halifax Armdale. Mr. Speaker, in January, I was proud to attend the launch of the new Access to Justice and Law Reform Institute of Nova Scotia at Dalhousie Schulich School of Law. It was a privilege to have served in my capacity as Minister Order. of Justice five Order. years ago. Order. Order. Just going to get everyone to quiet down a bit. The member can restart her statement. Mr. Speaker, in January, I was proud to attend the launch of the new Access to Justice and Law Reform Institute of Nova Scotia at Dalhousie Schulich School of Law. It was a privilege to have served in my capacity as Minister of Justice five years ago as co-chair in the inception of the Access to Justice Coordinating Committee with Chief Justice Michael McDonald. This year, the Law Reform Commission of Nova Scotia is transitioning to become the institute to focus on both law reform and access to justice projects, including Talk Justice. The institute will continue to make recommendations to update, clarify, and simplify the law and improve the administration of justice, ensuring the public and our most voluble populations have access to affordable and comprehensible legal help is essential. We know barriers to accessing that assistance still exist. Please join me in thanking the Access to Justice Coordinating Committee and all partners that assisted in this valuable work. Thank you. The member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is my honour to rise today and commemorate the life of Colonel Roger Cotton, a distinguished and well-respected native of Spring Hill who lost his battle with cancer at the age 54. Military personnel from across Canada and around the world deployed on Spring Hill to pay tribute to Colonel Roger Cotton during the official military funeral, filling the streets and honouring the fellow soldier with a ceremonial 21-gun salute. Colonel Cotton has served in many positions in Afga Afghanistan, Cyprus, Bosnia, Macedon Macedonia. Colonel Cotton was also awarded commemorations as the Chief of Defence Staff, Commander of Canadian Military Army, and Commander Combo Combined Joint Operations. I ask the House to join me in a moment of silence to honour the life of Colonel Roger Cotton and thank him for his service to this country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for King South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, one of the many great privileges of serving as an MLA is the opportunity to get to know the volunteers who make extraordinary contributions to our communities. Every spring for the last 15 years, Winnie Horton has quarterbacked the Canadian Federation of University Women's annual book sale in Wolfville, an event that celebrated its 50th anniversary last year. I use the word quarterback because the book sale while a team effort, needs someone to organize the Saturday collection of used books for six months, recruit the volunteers, troubleshoot, and convene the Acadia football team to move almost 700 boxes of books from storage at the Lions Hall. Winnie and her late husband John, who I recognized in this house in 2016, epitomize the qualities of, ext of extraordinary citizens. Mr. Speaker, I invite the members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in thanking Winnie Horton for her volunteer leadership and deep commitment to our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to take a moment. I, I want to apologize to the member from Cumberland South. I had missed his moment of silence, so we'll, we'll take that now. Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Whistleberry Market and Eatery has recently opened for business in Pleasant Valley with a grand opening planned for spring. 
Owner Peter Zare and his family are eager and ready to provide a new and exciting shopping experience to the people of Pictou County, as well as travellers dropping in from the nearby highway. This business provides homemade smoked meats, cheese, baked goods, and basic groceries, along with a wide selection of fine, high-quality local products such as jams, honey, and maple syrup. Congratulations to the Whistleberry Market and Eatery. I know this venue will be a popular draw to our community and will continue to highlight the tremendous local products and small businesses we are proud to have in rural Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Timberley Prospect. Speaker, on December 10th, 2018, with great sadness, we observed the passing of one of BLT community's most dedicated and accomplished community volunteers, Catherine Cleffens. In 2000, Catherine registered the Beachville Lakeside Timberley Rails to Trails Association and became its founding president, a position she held until the spring of 2018. In 2002, the Nova Scotia Trails Federation presented Catherine with the White Hill Summit Award for her groundbreaking work on behalf of hiking and multi-use trails for Halifax. In the course of her work, Catherine served as chair of the Halifax Regional Trails Association and worked to secure funding from HRM and the province of Nova Scotia for regional trails. Her efforts resulted in linking Halifax Trails with the Trans-Canada Trail and helped to establish the Rum Runners Trail, an initiative to promote active ecotourism in Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of the Legislative Assembly to recognize Catherine's many contributions. Her work on behalf of Nova Scotia Trails will be enjoyed for generations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I stand to bring recognition to the amazing legacy of Brigadoon Village left behind by the tragic loss of camp founder Dave McCaig. At the young age of 49, Dave passed away due to complications from treatment during his fourth battle with cancer. It was after Dave's experience with leadership roles in summer camps that he realized that this camp concept could work. After planning hard work and fundraising, the doors opened to Brigadoon Village. An estimated 3,000 children have visited the camp with diagnoses of asthma, epilepsy and arthritis, just to name a few. These children have had the opportunity of a lifetime to feel that they are not alone. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in acknowledging the amazing work of Dave McCaig for seeing hopes and dreams and the passion he had to follow through with his own. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Freedom Foundation of Dartmouth North, who celebrated its 30th anniversary last fall. Founded by Joe Gibson, Freedom Foundation opened its doors in 1989 in Dartmouth North to assist men recovering from addiction by providing services that foster recovery and build positive self-image and self-worth in a secure and caring environment. Over the last 30 years, Freedom Foundation has seen thousands of men with different addictions and needs come through the door and has helped many find their path to sobriety and health through their program. In April of last year, the Freedom Foundation opened a second home right across the street from the original one, which still operates to this day. The Dr. John Savage House offers supportive housing to men who are integrating back into the community. Mr. Speaker, the effects of addictions reach almost everybody at some point in their lives, and the folks at Freedom Foundation are dedicated to helping men that come through the doors to control their addictions and rebuild their lives. It is a place of support and healing. I ask all members of the House to join me in acknowledging the important work happening at Freedom Foundation and to thank Joe and Sandra and all who work and live there for their contribution to Dartmouth North. The member for Fairview Clayton Park. Mr. Speaker, today I'd like to recognize Robert Rockwell and his family on the 24th anniversary of their bi-monthly free family newspaper, Parent and Child Guide. Parent Child Guide is an essential resource for many families, couples, and individuals. Flipping through its pages, you can read articles on relationship advice, self-help suggestions, child safety, and even pet care. Better yet, many of the major articles are written by local professionals. Over the years, Parent Child Guide has significantly grown its readership. It's estimated that the newspaper has over 300,000 views a year, with, an, with approximately 5 million readers since 1995. An impressive feat for sure. As Metro's oldest free family newspaper, Parent Child Guide continues to provide important and relevant information to the people of Halifax. So I ask all members of this House to join me in wishing Robert and his family continued success. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to rise today to acknowledge Emma Bennett. In January of this year, the grade eight Leslie Thomas Junior High School student won the gold medal at the 2019 Canadian National Taekwondo Championships held in Quebec City.
As a result of this win, Emma will now be fighting in June at the 2019 Pan American Cadet and Junior Championship Games as part of Team Canada, which will be held in Portland, Oregon, as well as the World Cadet Championship, which will be held in the Republic of, I'm going to try this one, Mr. Speaker, Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan, thank you, in August. Mr. Speaker, Emma is a third degree black belt and has been training has been training for nine years. She's a role model to the younger sister Claire and many of the students in her Taekwondo class. Mr. Speaker, Emma is obviously a dedicated athlete who trains hard and rarely misses classes. And I'd like to take an opportunity to thank Emma and wish her great success and a safe, happy trip. Thank you. The member for Waverly Fall River Beaverbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was very excited to learn to follow Beaver Bank resident Emily Alford there we go. on her journey to the WIN or W I N M A U World Masters Dart Championships in England last fall. This trip was an exciting competition experience for Emily, but also a family celebration of her mother's battle and recovery from cancer. Emily secured a top 16th place finish at, at the competition and got to practice and socialize many of the world's best dart throwers. This trip to England was an experience of a lifetime and more than exceeded her expectations. Prior to and during her trip, there was much community support for the Lockview High School student, which uh, is a testament to her wonderful qualities of this young lady. On behalf of our community, I wish Emily future success and she pursues her dream to compete internationally. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to congratulate the so sure Major Bantam Lumberjacks who capped off a successful season with a bronze medal win at the 2019 Nova Scotia Major Bantam League Provincials in Pictou County. Not only did the team capture a medal, but also two players were rewarded for their great efforts during the tournament. Luke Woodworth named a tournament forward All-Star, and Ryan Hopkins received a tournament defenseman All-Star award. Luke was also the tournament's point lead, collecting 15 points in total over the six games. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank coaches Sean Woodworth, Adam Maslin, Jeremy Keeney, and Keegan Watt for their dedication, and to all the Jacks for providing a great hockey entertainment to fans and Queen County. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Today I'll recognize Bob Crinion of Hammonds Plains. Bob's a third generation ice boater who's ranked second in Canada and 29th in the world. He belongs to a club of approximately 12 ice boaters in the Maritimes who will notify each other of favorable ice conditions to enjoy their sport. An ice boat's a lightweight vessel that uses its sail to glide on the ice. The boat, boats use weigh much less than the sailor that, that persons it, and Bob calls it an adrenaline junkie's sailing machine. Bob grew up in Mahone Bay and had to walk across ice to get to school at times falling in. Uh, so he learned how to pu pull himself out of the ice, which is something that helps in the sport. He began ice boating with his grandfather and father as a teenager and can use, continues to do it in retirement. I would ask all... no. All people in the House of Nova Scotia to join me and congratulate Mr. Crinion for following his passion of ice boating and being an ambassador for the sport. The member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize the opening of a time capsule found on the cornerstone of the former Thompson High School as demolition of the seven-year-old school took place recently. The Northside Historical Society President Joe Meany opened the box to find the contents in relatively good shape. Contents included lists of town officials, stamps, coins, school yearbook, newspaper, and letters of the day. The opening ceremony was attended by Chuck Thompson, grandson of Mayor Charles Thompson, whom after school was named. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Northside Historical Society for opening the door to this, this history 70 years ago. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Chester St. Margaret. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to congratulate the volunteers who have worked so hard to bring the Bootleers Point outdoor rink back to life as a community gathering spot with new lighting, netting, benches, and most importantly, a groomed ice surface. 
The rink, located on Island View Drive, was first built in 1954, rebuilt in 1966, but had deteriorated over recent years. Thanks to the dedicated volunteers in the community, the rink is now providing much needed outdoor winter recreation opportunities for residents. This past New Year's Eve, volunteers organized a celebration featuring skating, a barbecue, hot coffee and chocolate, and even live music, all free for the 60 people who turned up to share the evening. The organizers hope to raise funds to develop and operate the facility as both a winter and summer recreation resource for additional active living opportunities. Mr. Speaker, I invite the members of the Assembly to join me in thanking the volunteers who are making an important contribution to the active living infrastructure of their community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Cumberland North. M Mr. Speaker, today I'd like to recognize Jacob Melanson of Amherst. He's a 15-year-old young man who was selected to join Team Nova Scotia at the Canada Winter Games for Hockey. Jacob has been working hard to achieve a goal like this, scoring 63 goals and 101 points for the Turo Bearcats. Jacob is the first men's member of the team from Cumberland County since 2011 and has made his community proud. Jacob has worked hard to reach his goal and is hoping this will help him to get into the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. Please join me in wishing Jacob congratulations for participating in this year's Canada Winter Games. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Lunenburg. Mr. Speaker, volunteers are an integral part of every community. They give their time and services willingly in order to make positive improvements to the world around them. I rise today to recognize Gail Saker. Gail is a volunteer that has been organizing the Mahone Bay Centre's meet and greet eat lunches for over four and a half years. She has spent many hours making soups and sandwiches, turkey dinners, Irish stew, along with other volunteers. Gail has recently stepped down as the organizer of these events, but will remain active on the committee. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that you and all members of this House of Assembly join me in thanking Gail for her contribution to the Mahone Bay Centre over, the, over numerous years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is my honour to rise today to remember three doctors that were memorialized for their services during the mine disasters in Spring Hill. On December, in December 2018, friends and family gathered to acknowledge the medical services, sacrifices and contributions made to the mining community of Spring Hill in the diffi difficult decades of the 1950s. Dr. Burden, Dr. Fisher and Dr. Murray were honoured with a plaque that will hang in the Dr. Carson and Mar Marion Murray Community Centre in Spring Hill. These doctors played an integral part in the community, especially during the 1956 explosion, which claimed the lives of 39 men, and the bump of 1956, which claimed the lives of 75 men. I ask this House to join me in remembering these three men who worked tirelessly for their patients and their community through these difficult days, and we will never forget the impact they made on the community of Spring Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for King South. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's an honour to stand in this chamber today to congratulate Hans Peter Stutz of Grand Prix Wines on receiving the Annapolis Valley Chamber of Commerce 2018 Lifetime Achievement Award. Hans Peter is certainly a very deserving recipient of this prestigious honour. Since beginning his pioneering work in the 1990s, he has been at the forefront of, Nova Scotia, of the Nova Scotia wine industry, and his exceptional vision and dedication have played a vital role in putting our region's wine, culinary, and tourism industries on the map. His contributions to the economic success and the vibrancy of our community are truly exceptional. And while this award honors a lifetime of success, I know that Hans Peter is not done yet. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in a toast to a remarkable Nova Scotian, Hans Peter Stutz. The member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, on the night of Sunday, March 10th, 2019, fires raged in the seat of Mi'kmaq governance on historic Chapel Island. Mr. Speaker, Chapel Island has served as a spiritual centre for the Mi'kmaq people for thousands of years. The annual St. Anne's Mission attracts thousands of visitors each year for prayer and celebration. It was the meeting place of the Atlantic Canada Mi'kmaq chiefs from seven districts who travelled each summer to meet as a Grand Council.
The first mass was celebrated on Chapel Island in 1742. Mr. Speaker, by the time the Bodledeg Fire Department arrived at the wharf across from Chapel Island, 14 of the approximately 170 cabins on the island were already burning. Members of the small fire department carried portable pumps across the narrow channel, separating the island at the southern end of the Bredore Lakes from Bodledeg First Nation. A chainsaw was used to cut through the ice to enable water to be pumped from the lake. Mr. Speaker, I wish to commend the members of the Bodledeg Fire Department as well as members of the St. Peter's Volunteer Fire Department who assisted in controlling the fires and prevented it from spreading to the church and to the additional cabins on the island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Kings West. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, for over 20 years, the local subway in Greenwood has provided exemplary service to all under the leadership of franchisee Lori Penny. Laurie is an individual who truly epitomizes the very essence of community. The local subway is well known for supporting numerous community events, including seniors' lunches, school lunch programs, sports teams, tournaments, and much more. She has been pre uh, previously and very fittingly described by a colleague as putting the unity in community. Lori has recently announced her retirement, and I know how much her business presence will be missed at the local subway, restaurant, and beyond. I am certain that Lori will continue to be a strong and dedicated member of the community, and I cannot wait to see what her next venture will be. Mr. Speaker, I'll ask the House to please join me in wishing Lori Penny and her family well as she enters her well-deserved retirement. Thank you. The member for Annie Ganesh. Mr. Speaker, Anna Kanish is known as a place for social activism and innovative volunteer-driven community projects. And the training begins early for our volunteers. Recently, after schoolers at the Children's Place Learning Centre in Anna Kanish held a month-long clothing drive to donate to the Opportunity Shop. They passed out flyers, asked family members and friends for help, and raised awareness at their schools. The children gathered 50 bags of quality used clothing to donate to the not-for-profit second-hand store, which sells clothing and donates proceeds to various charities in town and county. In spite of the frigid temperatures, on March 8th, the children could be seen walking across town to deliver their donations to the op shop. The children were inspired by a letter they received from the Prime Minister, who challenged them to take on the task of making their community a better place, and that they could change the world. Mr. Speaker, I invite all members to join me in congratulating these inspiring young Nova Scotians. The member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Caden McLeod, a 16-year-old from Bedeck, was one of seven members of Team Nova Scotia competing in cross-country skiing at the Canada Games at Red Deer. During the Canada Games recently in February, Caden showed her stamina and her Cape Breton determination with her final positions as 47th in the free fem female sprint, 29th in the 10km mass start female classic, and 36th in the 7.5km female interval start. I rise today to congratulate Caden on her accomplishments at the Canada Winter Games and to thank her family and her head coach Daniel Murray, coaches Lila and coach Kate for their encouragement, guidance and assistance. Keep up the great work, Caden. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Guysboro Eastern Shore, Trackety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Destination Eastern and Northumberland Shores Gala Awards Dinner will be held on April 6th of this year, and I am so pleased to see so many dynamic businesses being celebrated for their success. Of the many nominees, I am proud to see great representation from the Geyser Eastern Shore Trackety riding. The Henley House Pub and Restaurant in Cheat Harbour is up for the Flavour Award, and Out of the Fog Museum at the Halfway Cove is nominated for the Chief Experience Opportunity Award, and the newly constructed Shedabucto Lifestyle Complex in Guysboro is in the running for the Mike Broomfield Rising Star Award. Mr. Speaker, the tourism industry of Nova Scotia is booming, particularly in Southwest Nova. Sure. Our unique establishments and the endearing people that run them, I would like to wish the best of luck to all the deserving nominees, but just a little bit more luck to those previously mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The members of the Nova Scotia Heaven Assembly today, I would like to recognize Larry and Kelly Burke, the proprietors of Burke and Burke and residents of Shad Bay. In 1918, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, the First World War came to an end. The newly issued stamp celebrates this armistice and commemorates those who fought and died for peace. 
On October 24, 2018, Canada Post issued a stamp marking the 100th anniversary of this armistice, and it was a submission of the marketing company of Burke & Burke that was selected for the stamp's design. This is not the first time I've had the pleasure of announcing Burke & Burke's design achievements. In 2014, the firm won a similar national design competition. In 2018, the firm received a commission from Canada Post to create a commemorative stamp for the 100th anniversary of the Halifax explosion. Stamps recognizing momentous events in Canada's history are significant cultural landmarks. Commemorative stamps also mark significant events in the activities of Canada's philatelic community. Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in recognizing Burke and Burke for their personal, professional awards and national recognition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Armdale. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on February 7th, I was delighted to attend a special occasion by joining the Canadian College of Acupuncture and Traditional Chinese Medicine in Bedford for their 10-year anniversary and Chinese New Year celebration. It was great to be able to speak with their students, learn more about their backgrounds and future plans, and encourage them as they begin to build their careers. As the first and only private career college providing education and training of acupuncture in Atlantic Canada, the Canadian College of Acupuncture and Traditional Chinese Medicine has graduated hundreds of students, creating job opportunities treating the public at large. The college also provides many free treatments to our communities through their outreach events. I want to applaud the college's president, Dr. Diana Tong Lee, and chairman, Dr. Frank Chen, for their fascinating work and devotion, and ask all members to join me in congratulating them on their 10-year anniversary. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West with 30 seconds. Fairview Clayton Park. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize an outstanding academic achievement in one of the schools in my riding. During the last term, over 203 students received honours at Fairview Junior High School. That means 46% of students had an average of 80% or higher, which I think is pretty incredible. Not only is this achievement a result of individual hard work, it's also important to mention and thank our dedicated teachers for their commitment to student excellence. I ask that members of this House of Assembly join me in acknowledging the hard work of the students of Fairview Junior High and thanking the teachers for their continued support. Thank you very much. Right on time, we'll now move on to oral questions. Questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Premier says there's no crisis in health care. The government says there's enough capacity in the system already, and yet we see people being turned away from emergency rooms. We see physicians leaving the province due to the working conditions. Speaker, we see Nova Scotians struggling to access health care. Here in the real world, there are serious problems in health care. But in the budget world, not so much, Mr. Speaker. So I'd like to ask the Premier, is the message that he is trying to send to Nova Scotians that is that Nova Scotians and everyone working in health care, that everything is just fine, there are no problems, our health care system is great. Is that the message? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, he would know, Mr. Speaker, if you listen to the budget, there's a 6.2% increase in the budget for health care. Mr. Speaker, he would also know there are 15 residence seats for physicians that uh, that will be dedicated to Hazard University, Mr. Speaker, an increase. He would also know we have 10 dedicated seats for nurse practitioners. Continuing, uh, if he had followed over the last number of years, we're hiring almost all of the graduates of the nursing schools in our province, Mr. Speaker. We continue to see the average age of nursing drop uh, because we're continuing to hire more in, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we continue to recognize it requires investment in frontline health care. At the same time, uh, we also know through successive governments, Mr. Speaker. The infrastructure of health care has been ignored. Uh, it is no longer being ignored, Mr. Speaker. This government has the largest single infrastructure investment in public health care in our province. Mr. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, last year, uh, this government put an extra $100 million into health care. And I don't think you could find a single Nova Scotian that says the health care system is functioning better than it was. This year, they're putting more money in. But if it's not properly managed, you won't get the results, and that's really the service. That's really the problem, uh, Mr. Speaker. Services are not improving. There is a lack of credibility on the health care file, and we've all heard we've all heard about the issues surrounding shortages of nurses and situations where we're, the the province is paying huge overtime amounts, or nurses aren't allowed to take vacation. Can the premier can the premier explain travel nurses? Another one. Can the premier explain? why there is no specific additional 
funding dedicated exclusively for the hiring of nurses, or does, a, or does the Premier believe there are enough nurses in the province right now? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. As I said in my first answer, Mr. Speaker, we, uh, for the first time of any government in the province, we've dedicated seats for nurse practitioners. We provided a path for RNs in this province, Mr. Speaker, to go while they're continuing to work, to go to continue to take more training, become nurse practitioners. I also said in my previous answer, Mr. Speaker, we're hiring almost all of the nursing grads in this province, Mr. Speaker. He made a large accusation about the health care in this province. Those 4,000 Nova Scotians at orthopedic surgery last year, Mr. Speaker, would respond that they felt a very positive experience. I would also tell you, Mr. Speaker, that the new people are being hired into the health care system are telling you there are positive experiences. But, Mr. Speaker, we've listened to Nova Scotia. There are challenges associated in some of our communities. We're continuing to work with those communities to ensure that we attract health care providers. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, investing in the physical infrastructure that health care providers tell us is required to not only to attract but to retain those health care providers in our communities today. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, bigger hallways is not the answer to hallway medicine. There are serious problems in the health care system. Everyone in this province knows we have an aging population and we have a major shift in our demographics happening in this province, but time and time again we hear that hospitals and emergency departments are bottlenecked because the government has failed to provide adequate long-term care facilities and access to beds. And yet in this budget, there's not a single dollar for more long-term care beds. And that's a serious problem, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask the Premier, the system is either massively mismanaged or there are not enough long-term care beds. Which one is it, Mr. Premier? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would say for the decade that the Tories were in power, they neglected physical infrastructure in this province. That is a far reality, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member may not think it's important to invest in the Cape Breton Regional, Mr. Speaker, and I can tell you the health care providers in the province do. The Honourable Member may not, Mr. Speaker, believe it's important to invest in the QE2 redevelopment, but I can tell you health care providers across this province do, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member is complaining about us adding another 120 long-term care beds in Cape Breton, Mr. Speaker. He may not appreciate that, Mr. Speaker, but Mr. Speaker, Cape Bretoners will, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from... Member, the Honourable Member from Berwick and Argyle is standing up complaining, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm going to tell you, the people in Metagan appreciate the redevelopment, Mr. Speaker, and the additional bids that will take place, Mr. Speaker. And I look forward, and Mr. Speaker, I look forward to him telling in both official languages to those people they don't deserve those bids. The Honourable Leader of the official New Democratic Party. In recent weeks, Mr. Speaker, in the emergency rooms of Nova Scotia, we've had people being sent home with pink sheets because the ER was too jammed up to receive them. We have people in the Cobbacud being fed out of vending machines because uh, they need to be kept there in a facility that was uh, not intended for that. We've got doctors and nurses in Kentville and Dartmouth and Halifax and Sydney uh, really speaking out about chaotic and untenable circumstances in their ERs. And we know that a core reason for all of this is that emergency rooms have nowhere to discharge their patients because so much of their hospitals are filled with people waiting for nursing home placements for whom there are no places. In the middle of a health care crisis where this is the case, why would the Premier bring in a budget with no comprehensive program for new nursing home construction in our province? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, he would know the very health care redevelopment that he's been campaigning against in Cape Breton is adding additional long-term care beds there. Mr. Speaker, he would also know, uh, Mr. Speaker, the long-term care facility in Metagon, as well as the one in Mahone Bay, uh, will continue to be redeveloped at the same time, adding long-term care beds to those communities. Uh, the Minister of Finance in her uh, budget speech uh, said there would be more opportunity as we continue to work with our partners to providing a long-term care within the fiscal envelope of the province, Mr. Speaker. He would also know uh, the redevelopment that's happening in and around the Cape Breton Regional and here at the QE2 is providing those efficiency in emergency rooms to ensuring that we're providing those that require emergency service will get in a timely manner, but at the same time providing the physical infrastructure so that those who are looking for primary care in our, in our emergency rooms will have access to that in other parts of the facilities in our redevelopment components. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. 
Mr. Speaker, Mahone Bay, Matagan, North, North Sydney, New Water, this is not a comprehensive provincial program. A comprehensive provincial program of long-term care facilities is the 300-bed program that was on his desk the day that became the Premier, which ended up in the garbage can. Now, I understand that this budget includes increases for emergency health services in response to increases in call volumes, but in the emergency rooms themselves, which are already up against it because there's no place to discharge their patients, this uh, increased volume could very well have the effect, as one doctor has put it to me, of supercharging the whole emergency room problem because the new patients being brought in uh, haven't got any place to go. Does the Premier understand that if you move more people into an already crowded space with no place for them to exit, that that space is going to become more crowded than it was before. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Mr. Speaker, what was on my desk the day I became Premier, Mr. Speaker, was a $600 million hole left behind by the former government and a bunch of promises. Mr. Speaker, and a bunch of promises with no ability or no path to pay for them, Mr. Speaker. The budgets the Honourable Member has been voting against in this House, Mr. Speaker, are providing a clear path to economic stability, allowing us to make the largest single investment in health care infrastructure in the history of this province, while retaining a balanced budget, investing in Nova Scotia's, hiring more health care workers, and at the same time, providing a realistic path to providing more long-term care beds in our communities. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. It would be a privilege to vote against a budget which has no place in it for a comprehensive program of nursing home replacement and building in Nova Scotia. Look, there is a consensus that is being developed about this. Doctors speak about how uh, long-term care facilities are needed to take the pressures off ERs. Nurses are speaking in various venues about how long-term care facilities are needed in order for them to be able to provide the kind of care in ERs that's needed. Health care policy specialists are saying the very same thing. The only people who don't think that a comprehensive program of new nursing homes is needed for us in Nova Scotia are the 27 members of this government. What makes the Premier think that the Nova Scotia Liberals know so much more about ERs and new long-term care facilities than anybody else in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable for the question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in his uh, preamble, Mr. Speaker, he echoed to the voices of many health care providers who recognize we need to continue uh, to provide and expand uh, the delivery of not only primary care but long-term care. They also talked, Mr. Speaker, uh, about ensuring that we provide home care. We continue to invest in those. The Minister today in her budget announced four communities that would see an increase of long-term care beds, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member is listening to those health care providers when it comes to long-term care beds. I hope he takes a moment in time and listens, Mr. Speaker, to the health care providers in Cape Breton Island, who yesterday said it was a game-changer when it comes to increasing primary care in those communities, making sure cancer care, Mr. Speaker. One of them said, can you imagine what else can we do about bringing care closer to our citizens? That's exactly what happened yesterday in Cape Breton that he voted against. So he can't listen to some health care workers, Mr. Speaker. He needs to listen to the wall when we provide a comprehensive health care policy to our province. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This budget implies there are no issues with the delivery of EHS services. That's the exact opposite of what we're hearing from actual Nova Scotians. Paramedics, people waiting long wait times for, for services. Now, today's numbers, the budget today, doesn't do anything to address the issues surrounding the lack of ambulances across this province. There's no new money uh, for EHS in this budget today. How does the Premier reconcile what's happening with ambulance backlogs at emergency departments and the lack of avail availability of ambulances with not providing an increase in the budget? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Honourable Member know we have a contract with the EHS, we continue to implement and we continue to work with our partners. Mr. Speaker, they've continued to give us advice on how we continue to work uh, to ensure the offload times change, we can deal with people in long-term care. We're taking and working with them, quite frankly, to provide new ways to delivering health care in our province, and we appreciate the work and advice that they are providing to us. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Premier can wring his hands and push it off to somebody else, but the reality is there's a serious problem with access to EHS in this, in this province. And this government had a chance to acknowledge it in their budget, in their budget today, and they decided not to. Uh, Mr. Speaker, anyone looking ahead can see that we need a clear vision for the delivery of health care in this province. But we don't see it in this budget. This budget says there's capacity, says there's enough nurses, says the doctors are fairly compensated. 
There is a crisis in health care, and this budget doesn't acknowledge it. I'd like to ask the Premier if the Premier really believes we have enough nurses, we have enough ambulances, doctors are fairly paid. If the Premier really believes these things, then that means the resources we have are being severely mismanaged. Which one is it, Mr. Premier? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, again, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to continuing to have budget debate uh, as we continue uh, to roll out all the investments that we've made in health care. I again want to thank uh, the paramedics across this province who provide services in our communities, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the fact that this is we pay for volume, and I would encourage the Honourable Member, I know we just saw the document today, Mr. Speaker, but there's a $4.6 million increase for AHS, Mr. Speaker. $4.6 million, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change told the world that what is required to address the crisis of climate change is what it called a rapid escalation of the level of ambition towards containing global warming to 1.5 degrees. Today, the Minister of Finance has delivered a budget address in which the terms climate and climate change appear a total of zero times. Does the Premier believe that a budget that shows no provincial leadership on creating green jobs, no provincial leadership on reducing emissions, no provincial leadership on investing in climate change adaptation, does the Premier believe that this demonstrates what the IPC calls this rapid escalation of a level of ambition which the world knows is called for? The Honourable Premier. I want, to thank, uh, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank all Nova Scotians for continuing to lead the country in GHG reduction, Mr. Speaker. We are well. Uh, we've met our target uh, by 2030. We're 30% below 2005 levels, Mr. Speaker. He would also know we're well on target to be about 50% by 2030, uh, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is, in today's budget, we announced $7 million for green infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. We had $14.3 million to help Nova Scotians with home energy efficiency to reduce their greenhouse footprint, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's a $23 million associated directly with dealing with the green economy, creating green jobs, and helping Nova Scotians reduce their carbon footprint, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that may not seem like a lot of money to the Honourable Member, but Mr. Speaker, it's a lot of money to Nova Scotians. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, on the, on the day that this legislature last met, I had the privilege here of joining hundreds of high school students and other young people who took part in a global climate strike led by the kids themselves here as around the world. These young people are calling out with strength and conviction and also out of desperation for politicians like us to take decisive action to address climate change because they were very clear in that demonstration it's their view that it's them and not us who will face the consequences of a lack of action. Mr. Speaker, what does the Premier think it says to those young people that this government's budget address today does not even include the term climate change? Change. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, I really, Mr. Speaker, those young people should be proud of the fact that successive governments of all political stripes in this province have taken this issue seriously. We continue to lead the country in our carbon footprint reduction. Mr. Speaker, those are all positive signs. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to assure those young people that were here, uh, we're not resting on that, Mr. Speaker. Again, I just told the Honourable Member, there's 23 to $24 million invested directly in the green economy looking for green jobs to help us reduce our carbon footprint to deal with the very issues the Honourable Member is talking about. Uh, he would also know uh, the Minister is, I think Forestry has uh, laid out a, uh, a plan on, on coastal protection, ensuring that we deal with the issues along, uh, along our coastal communities, Mr. Speaker. We continue to listen uh, not only to those young people, Mr. Speaker, but all Nova Scotians who recognize we have an important role to play to help Canada reduce its carbon footprint at the same time ensuring uh, that we turn our economy into a green one. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If it is to continue its operations, Northern Pulp will require a new effluent treatment plan. There is much speculation that the province will contribute to the cost of any such new plan. However, there's nothing allocated in the budget for that type of expenditure. Can the Premier confirm how much the province plans to contribute towards a new effluent treatment plan, and when will the province book that amount? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we, uh, Mr. Speaker, as I, I've said many times in this House, uh, we continue to uh, work with Northern Pulp on the issue of the cleanup of Boat Harbour. We have a liability associated with uh, the closure of that facility uh, nine, uh, nine, almost ten years early. 
Uh, that liability negotiation is still ongoing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the honourable member uh, we as a government uh, take our responsibility uh, seriously, both uh, the liabilities associated with that particular facility at the same time, ensuring that we can keep the fiscal health of this province forward. And I also want to say to the honourable member, I'm still very optimistic, Mr. Speaker, that we can see uh, that Northern Pulp continue to operate in that community uh, in a way that allows us also to clean up the environment. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the issue is the Premier acknowledges that there's a liability. That means the province will pay something. If the province is going to pay something, it should be reflected in the budget. But Mr. Speaker, the Premier hasn't got around to putting it in the budget unless he wants to confirm to this House today. I asked staff today if there's anything for the new treatment plant. Nothing. Any change to the Boat Harbour cleanup? Nothing. Nothing in this budget for either of those two, which could be significant, have a significant financial impact in the province. If you don't put it in the budget, and you know it's coming, that's not being fully upfront with Nova Scotians. I'd like to give the Premier one chance to be, to be transparent, to be transparent and not hide the amount. Tell Nova Scotians what's the liability and when will you book it? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker Tim, Tim the negotiator, Mr. Speaker, uh, lay out all your cards on the table and then look for a deal, Mr. Speaker. I've said many times in this house, Mr. Speaker, I've said many times, Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is we don't have a liability when it comes to the treatment facility. We have a liability when it comes, Mr. Speaker, to reducing and closing Boat Harbour early. We're continuing that negotiation, Mr. Speaker. I want to assure the honourable member we continue to make uh, arrangements to be, deal with our liabilities when it comes to it. But, Mr. Speaker, Unlike former Conservative governments, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to lay out the amount that we believe we owe. We're going to negotiate that, Mr. Speaker, just like we've done with collective agreements, Mr. Speaker, just like we continue to do to make sure, to continue to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that not only, not only we deal with the environmental liabilities that have been ignored for decades by successive governments, but ensuring that we try to protect the jobs in the community the Honourable Member comes from, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to make sure that we stand with the hard-working Nova Scotians at the same time building an economy economy that all Nova Scotians see themselves in as we protect the environment and pay and Mr. Speaker and Mr. Speaker and let me finish Mr. Speaker and Mr. Speaker we'll do it by paying our bills on time. I'd just like to remind the Honourable Premier not to refer to members uh, opposite by their first names. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a very sad day for Nova Scotians. All we really heard was regurgitated funding announcements from several months ago, but what the government failed to mention was all of the critical funding cuts to health care, long-term care, and seniors. So we need some help, and maybe we'll get it from the federal government. I recently attended a town hall meeting with the federal minister of seniors and asked her if she would commit to ensuring that our health transfer payments were based on the age of our population, not the number of people. However, she had no idea what the federal health minister's policy was. It's troubling to me that she had no idea. So I'm going to ask the question to the Minister of Health. Does he know what the federal Minister of Health's policy is on this? And does he personally believe that the health transfer payments to our province should be based on the age of our population? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member uh, for the, the question. Uh, as the member and the members opposite may realize, I think a former Conservative federal government uh, changed the uh, approach to the uh, Canada Health uh, Transfer uh, Program, Mr. Speaker, uh, and that's a win a change to a, uh, a population-based uh, distribution, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that uh, continues to be uh, a foundational part of the uh, the funding model used by the uh, federal government uh, for the uh, Canada Health Transfers. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour, Eastern Passage. So, I had no idea whether that was a yes or a no, but we'll move on. Mr. Speaker, our aging population has high levels of chronic illness and it occupies nearly 50% of our health care budget. We are a small province and we've got large needs and this budget shows that this government does not know how to address those needs. Without proper advocacy from the Premier and his Minister of Health, it's unlikely that our funding from the federal government will change and you've had six years to work on this to more accurately reflect our demographics. 
This budget shows cuts to adult protection, Nova Scotia government cuts to client-specific expenses for long-term care, cuts to the Nova Scotia government for long-term care infrastructure. My question to the minister is, will the minister commit to advocating now for the needs of Nova Scotia's elderly population with his federal counterparts? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, through the uh, candidate health transfers, I've uh, mentioned uh, one of the uh, foundational pieces of the formula used by the federal government does include population-based uh, part of the formula. It's good news, Mr. Speaker, that in our province, uh, we've been increasing our population the last number of years uh, to help uh, improve uh, the transfers that we're receiving, Mr. Speaker. In addition, Mr. Speaker, uh, the work and the investments we've made uh, investing significantly in our home care support programs, Mr. Speaker, and various programs to help support our aged population, Mr. Speaker. That's exactly what the member who looks through this budget will see that we're supporting our, our aging populations. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour, Eastern Passage. So, Mr. Speaker, I still don't know whether he believes it should be based on age or population. Mr. Speaker, recently we made a call to all major home care providers in HRM that are funded by the provincial government. None of them are willing to directly bill the private health insurance companies for our seniors. This forces seniors to pay upfront up to $500 or more for benefits that they actually have coverage for. These administrative costs and additional hassles have made the private health insurers that our government has chosen to provide service contracts to the ability to avoid that problem. Adequate and affordable home care is a vital part of this government's funding, so I'm going to ask this government, can the Minister of Health explain to me why direct billing to private health plans continues to be optional rather than an expected per service provided by his service providers in this province? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the service providers for home care services, uh, we've invested uh, heavily since uh, forming government in 2013, Mr. Speaker. We've recognized and, and heard from Nova Scotians who indicate that uh, they want and are able to live in their homes uh, longer uh, with appropriate supports. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, that's why we've invested uh, to provide uh, more uh, access and more uh, contact hours uh, it, through our home care providers, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so we are listening to the uh, Nova Scotians who require uh, and can take advantage of this support uh, as they age in their home, in their community, and will continue to do that. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour, Eastern Passage. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll point out again that my question was, why are his service providers allowed to not directly bill? And it, again, I didn't get an answer. So, Mr. Speaker, we'll talk about long-term care beds. This government is finally admitting that we need more long-term care beds, something that the opposition have been calling for for the past six years since they've been in government. The Nova Scotia Health Authority charges a daily fee to people staying in acute care beds while awaiting placement in long-term care. They get that bill sent at the end of the month unless they live in Cape Breton, in which case they get it up front. When a patient receives placement in a long-term care facility, they've got to pay before they move in. So this means that we're double billing all of those seniors in acute care beds who are about to go into long-term care, and I don't know too many seniors who can afford this. So can uh, the minister tell me, does he believe that the current billing process is properly set up to ensure that our seniors are able to fully cover their expenses without bankrupting them? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As the member would know, the uh, fees being charged uh, by the Nova Scotia Health Authority for Nova Scotians that have been assessed and are waiting uh, for a long-term care placement uh, is to cover the accommodation costs only, Mr. Speaker. Uh, any medical costs associated uh, continue to be, uh, be covered. With respect to uh, the uh, number of Nova Scotians uh, that would be in that situation, Mr. Speaker, we've uh, been seeing improvements uh, with fewer Nova Scotians waiting specifically for long-term care uh, access uh, in our hospitals and those that have been waiting, Mr. Speaker, have been waiting less time to get placed from a hospital into a long-term care facility. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. Over the past several weeks, Nova Scotians have been sounding the alarm about the state of emergency care. In North Sydney and Dartmouth, patients have been told to go home without being seen because the emergency department is just too crowded to see them. Imagine being a parent with a sick child, no family doctor, then showing up at an emergency room only to be told that there's no room for you either. 
Mr. Speaker, will the minister admit this budget does nothing to address the crisis in our emergency rooms that is putting Nova Scotians at risk? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this budget uh, supports uh, our health care system. Uh, this is a significant uh, part of our, our budget, Mr. Speaker, the, the speech and the, the budget that was tabled by my colleague, the Minister of Finance, earlier today. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, I believe that this budget is working to uh, invest and improve uh, the delivery of health care services throughout the system. Mr. Speaker, the health care system is, is uh, tightly integrated. Uh, improvements in primary care uh, supports and access can help reduce pressures in our emergency department the expansion and the continued expansion of collaborative care practices to help improve primary care access throughout our communities, Mr. Speaker. These are steps that will help improve uh, reduce the pressures in our emergency departments. Just one part of the investments being made, $10 million additional in this budget this year. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sadly, though, Mr. Speaker, that is uh, down the road in the future. That's not addressing the crisis that is resulting in people dying today as the member from the paramedics said if they don't if the ambulance isn't there they will die so the crisis is today mr speaker not in 2020 or 2025 mr speaker for the second year in a row the budget includes payments to ehs because there are more people in need of ambulances in the province. Not only are paramedics struggling to offload patients in overcrowded emergency rooms, but also patients cannot be admitted to hospitals because there's hundreds of people in the hospital who are waiting for long-term care. Mr. Speaker, will the minister acknowledge that sending more people to an overcrowded emergency room, to an overcrowded emergency department will just make things worse? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I apologize. I'm not sure I understand the, uh, the, the essence of, of what the member was getting at there. What I can tell the member, though, Mr. Speaker, is as I answered in my first response, uh, Mr. Speaker, we're actually investing over t uh, an additional $10 million this year to increase primary care access through collaborative care teams, Mr. Order, Speaker. Please. The Honourable Minister of Health. That investment to uh, establish new and expand existing uh, collaborative care practices for primary care, Mr. Speaker, is exactly about keeping uh, people to receive the care that they need through primary care providers in their communities to keep them out of the emergency departments. Mr. Speaker, I hope the member opposite is not suggesting that Nova Scotians uh, should not be calling names. In fact, they should be. If they have a medical emergency, Mr. Speaker, to call the ambulance, and the ambulance will get you to the emergency department, you will be triaged, you will receive your emergency care, Mr. Speaker, that you need and deserve, because that's what our dedicated healthcare professionals on the front line are doing. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government seems to be under the impression that commissioning a report is equivalent to solving a problem. Many great recommendations came from the dementia strategy four years ago, but very few of them have been implemented. I fear that this year's long-term care report is headed for the same fate. This government today announced a whole $2.8 million to fund the recommendations from the long-term care report that's going to improve wound care, service coordination, and staffing. Does this Minister of Health... I would be embarrassed to clap at that. Does this minister really believe that $2.8 million in funding is going to actually fulfill the dozens of recommendations made in the long-term care report? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, the member for uh, drawing attention to uh, this important work that was conducted uh, over the fall, Mr. Speaker, uh, by a, an expert uh, panel of, uh, of, of individuals, uh, physician and nurses, Mr. Speaker, uh, to provide us with recommendations. If the member refers back to that report, what you will notice, Mr. Speaker, is that it is a, a culmination of, of short, medium, and long-term recommendations, Mr. Speaker. What we are investing in, that the member highlighted, investments of 2.8 $8 million dollars in this fiscal year. That's on top of $2.2 million, Mr. Speaker, that we announced last week. Mr. Speaker, we're investing, that's $5 million of new investment uh, into uh, technology equipment, as well as programming supports, Mr. Speaker, for our long-term care sector. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, I am, I am as embarrassed as a health professional and as a politician that they would be clapping to these types of announcements, including the money for mattresses and slings and long-term care beds, which should have been in there all along. 
Mr. Speaker, I came from this morning presenting at a long-term care conference in Dartmouth, and I guarantee you they have a very different opinion of how this government is doing. Nova Scotians are tired of being hopeful about a report only to having it end up on a shelf. The dementia strategy, the 2010 Better Care Sooner report on emergency care, the list of reports goes on and on. I understand that implementing recommendations costs money, but $2.8 million for all of those recommendations for long-term care isn't going to get somebody to the toilet, isn't going to get their, their uh, bathroom privileges done. Given this government's track record with the implementation of reports, my question to the Minister of Health is will he commit to implementing all of the recommendations of the long-term care report and will he provide sufficient funding to do so? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, as I responded in my, my first uh, response to this uh, set of questions, uh, I made it clear, uh, going back to the recommendation that we received in, in January, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, the panel recognized that the nature of the recommendations, there are a number of short term uh, within six to, to, to 18 months, Mr. Speaker, and longer term uh, initiatives uh, to uh, be implemented. Uh, this budget that we announced uh, today, Mr. Speaker, is about uh, this uh, coming fiscal year and investments that we're going to be making. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that does not reflect uh, the total duration of time that even the, the expert panel and the recommendations suggested that the efforts would take to implement all of those recommendations. But we're here talking about the investments being made. That's uh, $2.8 million in today's budget. 2.2 that we announced just last week is $5 million, Mr. Speaker, going towards the start of the work to implement recommendations that were made just in January. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my questions to the Minister of Health. Two of my constituents are moving to Halifax because their family home in Mill Village has become too much for them. They are lucky to have a family doctor in Liverpool, and although she's agreed to keep them as patients, the commute back and forth to their appointments is simply too much for them. They've contacted 811, NSHA Patient Feedback, and NSHA Media Communications, and have yet to receive a clear answer as to whether or not they can join the 811 list and keep their current doctor. My question for the Minister is, are my constituents constituents able to join the 811 list without giving up their current doctor until they have a new one. The Honourable Minister of Health. M Mr. Speaker, uh, Nova Scotians can, can Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians can register uh, either by calling or uh, through online uh, to the 811 Need a Family uh, Practice. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, many Nova Scotians are doing that, uh, whether they're expecting their uh, their uh, physicians to retire coming up. So, Mr. Speaker, I believe there are many Nova Scotians who are registered on the list uh, with the anticipation of their physician retirement. So, uh, I would see that uh, possibility being there to be registered so they know when a new physician may be available. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm glad to hear that response, but I will say that the different bodies of the NSHA that they've contacted have used the word probably and reminded them that the list is for people without a doctor, not people looking for a different one. Nothing they've heard has given them confidence that they would be able to keep their doctor until they were matched with one closer to their new home. Everything they've heard has felt like it easily could be rescinded. So my question is, can the minister provide peace of mind and assure me that once their name is on the 811 list, it will remain there until they are matched with a new doctor in Halifax? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the work that uh, goes on to uh, verify uh, the process, uh, people do get matched with physicians, uh, then the uh, physicians uh, who are uh, uh, taking on new uh New uh, patients, Mr. Speaker, uh, are being uh, cross-referenced to, to verify that uh, people have been attached to, through that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in addition, Mr. Speaker, there are efforts to contact people who are waiting on a list uh, to uh, find out if they have been attached to, to verify before uh, individuals are being taken off of that list. So, Mr. Speaker, they're either hearing directly from the physicians uh, that they've been attached or, or primary care providers, or, Mr. Speaker, uh, they're following up with the residents themselves that are waiting on the list to verify when they come off of that list. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when the government cancelled the grant program for those taking the Continued Care Assistant course in SSC, the number of people registered for the course plummeted. This drop in registration has had a devastating effect on the ability of both private and public continuing care providers to hire and supply enough staff. In a long-term care report released in January, it was recommended the grant program be reinstated. So my question to the Minister in Labour and Advanced Education is, Will he commit to restoring the grant program for the CCA program? 
The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not aware of the cancellation of that program. I'm more than willing to look into it. If the member would like to provide information, I can do that. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Mr. Speaker, last year only 85% of the NSCC seats for the CCA program were filled. That's only 307 students, Mr. Speaker. When the grant program was in place, there was between 800 and 1,100 students being trained each year. That was the last time we did not have a CCA hiring issue. In other professions with recruiting and retention difficulties, the government has stepped in and implemented programs to help encourage students. Can the minister tell Nova Scotians why the NSCC received grant funding from the government to recruit early childhood educators, but there's been no such funding to fill the seats for the CCA program? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, again, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not aware of any cuts to any funding for that. And I can say to the member that the early childhood uh, funding was put in place because our government brought in a pre-primary program, which is providing primary, which is providing program care to all four-year-olds in the province, and that created order, a lot of please. The on order, please. The honourable minister of labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, as I was uh, mentioning, we provided the funding for education because our education department brought in a pre-primary program, which is providing. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount will come to order. The Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Maybe I can get my point across without being interrupted this time. So, Mr. Speaker, as I said, the reason that we brought in program funding for the NSCC was because we order, brought in... Order, please. If I have to call order uh, one more time for the interruptions and uh, to acknowledge the disrespect for this chair, people will start to leave. The Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So for a fourth time, Mr. Speaker, our government brought in a pre-primary program. We needed to hire many professionals for that, and what we did is we worked with our partners at the Nova Scotia Community College. We funded those seats, and Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of this government to have that program in place, and we're providing pre-primary program to all kids in the near future, and Mr. Speaker, it's great that we're well on this way of this program. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I have all of the information that the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education needs uh, with respect to that grant program. I'd be happy to provide it. Mr. Speaker, the caregiver allowance is one of the programs that the Premier Ministers tend to boast about, and we're happy about that. But I see no new increase in funds for this program, despite the fact that there are more and more people waiting for long-term care beds and the cost of care is going up. The threshold for this program remains such that, in my opinion, there are too many people who are unable to take advantage of it. Outside of an emergency, the majority of government programs to help seniors and caregivers have unrealistically low uh, income levels. My question is to the Minister of Health. Can he explain why only those with severe cognitive limitations are eligible for programs like the Adult Day Program, while those with physical limitations are left without support? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is a, a program that we expanded uh, last year, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, part of the uh, process that we uh, took for the expansion last year was actually looking at and expanding the access uh, based upon the uh, the needs assessment uh, of uh, the um, the residents, Mr. Speaker, of Nova Scotia. Uh, so we did expand based upon the criteria, the medical uh, criteria of the assessment uh, for these uh, these individuals, uh, so that more Nova Scotians last year uh, would be made available for this uh, particular program. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are smaller organizations like Caregivers Nova Scotia who are trying to compensate for the lack of planning on this government's part, and they are the backbone of supporting our crumbling health system. Caregivers Nova Scotia helps Nova Scotians navigate the resources and provide education, which helps this government's home first philosophy. Unfortunately, with a small budget, and I don't see any increase in this budget, they are underfunded and overutilized to the point where they only have one coordinator for all of Cape Breton, the South Shore, the, the um, northern areas, and only 1.5 in Metro. Many caregivers are forced to leave their jobs to care for loved ones and they need help from our government. Can the government's home first philosophy and relief that caregivers provide to the health care system, they need extra help. Can the minister tell me what other resources does this budget offer to the caregivers in Nova Scotia beyond what was already announced over the past five years? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we invest in, in supporting uh, Nova Scotians who choose to stay in their homes longer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that includes the investments. The investments we've been making, those investments, Mr. Speaker, that we've made in, the, in, in previous years carry forward uh, as costs uh, of these investments into the current year and into future years, Mr. Speaker, as we continue to deliver these programs. Those include significant investments uh, to support our, our home care providers, like I just mentioned in uh, the first response, the expansion of eligibility for the caregiver benefit, Mr. Speaker, but also the supports for home care uh, programs and supports, Mr. Speaker, of uh, home care programs as well as, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the medical needs. Uh, thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. In her budget address, the Minister stated, we are expanding child care services, ex investing $67 million this year. But in fact, Mr. Speaker, there hasn't been an expansion at all. The government has invested no new money when what we need is a universal system of affordable child care in order to achieve an equitable and expanded workforce. Mr. Speaker, can the minister confirm that this is in fact a status quo budget with no new money for licensed child care? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, as far as the comment about this being a status quo budget, I think the members should actually look at the increase, 6.2% increase in health care alone, 2.3% in education alone. Mr. Speaker, that's not status quo. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, no new funding, despite the fact that it's called new, uh, for licensed child care. Earlier this month, I asked the minister about women's economic security, and at that time she indicated that her department did gender-based analysis of their work. However, when we requested through Freedom of Information the gender-based analyses of budgets, legislations, programs, or policies, we received a letter, and I'll table it, saying that no such records exist. Mr. Speaker, will the minister table the gender-based analysis that supports this status quo budget for licensed child care? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I believe the question about gender-based was uh, uh, based on a comment that was uh, made by uh, the federal government about their using uh, gender-based budgeting for their process. I indicated that we were not using gender-based budget, that we were, but we were certainly looking through a gender-based lens on every program and every policy that we implement. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are many seniors in Nova Scotia who don't have access to a family doctor, so getting a prescription is already <laughs> difficult enough. Pharmacists have the legal right to prescribe and refill certain medications, which could allow seniors to access these medications they need when they don't have a family doctor. However, the support has not been provided through MSI to compensate pharmacists for this, which doesn't seem fair when they compensate physicians. It's unreasonable to ask a pharmacist to donate his time or her time to take on more responsibility without compensating them for it. My question to the Minister of Health is, has the government considered enhancing the role of pharmacists to fill the gaps left by family doctor shortage in this area both by providing them with MSI billing codes in order to allow them to be compensated for providing this needed service? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for uh, bringing uh, to the floor a, a recognition, acknowledgement uh, of the pharmacists uh, in this province, Mr. Speaker. Uh, pharmacists. Pharmacists that operate in, in uh, I think, approximately 305 uh, community pharmacies across the, the province, Mr. Speaker, providing care directly to uh, Nova Scotians. Uh, we've seen in, in uh, recent years the expansion of their uh, scope of practice, but in particular, Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge how great our relationship has been with the PANS and the pharmacies, uh, bringing to new programs like the Bloom program, uh, providing support uh, around uh, mental health uh, condition, Mr. Speaker. Work with, uh, Mr. Speaker, our Dick treatments and the delivery of naloxone as a, uh, a naloxone out to uh, individuals in communities to help uh, 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 help address opioid uh, overdose. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have a great working relationship. We continue to work with the concerns that they bring forward to us. The Honourable Member for Cole Arbor Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For far too long, the focus has been on acute care and crisis management. 
The doctor shortage is widespread in this province and it's happening everywhere. We need to be creative and innovative to our response to ensure that Nova Scotians of all ages receive the care that they deserve. There are prehabilitation specialists, social workers, community services uh, staff, continuing care staff, and I notice that some of those areas have funding cuts in this budget. Can the Minister of Health tell me how many professions in this budget are getting an increase in the number of health care professionals to provide social work care, to provide physiotherapy care, in the home care, in health care? We can't look at this budget and figure out whether staffing has gone up or down. The Honourable so Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as the member would know, since uh, the last number of years, we've been investing uh, and, and expanding access, particularly in the primary health care space, Mr. Speaker, as uh, part of our investments in collaborative practices in communities across the province. That's where, Mr. Speaker, you're seeing a number of those uh, allied uh, health professionals, uh, including nurses, including the social workers, Mr. Speaker, coming and, and, and having those opportunities to provide care. In this budget, Mr. Speaker, we invest an additional $10 million to continue the expansion and, and introduce new uh, collaborative care practices across the province. That's on top of the investments. And in the past, Mr. Speaker, since two th March of 2017, we've hired 130 uh, health care professionals to support these collaborative teams. This $10 million will go to hire even more. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the United Nations World Health Organization Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they've all stated that the largest threat to the global economy is climate change. Mr. Speaker, the World Economic Forum identified climate change as a dominant threat to health in 2019. My question through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Department of the uh, Minister of Department of Environment is does she really feel that 0 0.081 I'm sorry, 0.018% of an overall budget shows commitment of this government towards addressing climate change. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member for the question. I absolutely believe that this budget is exactly targeting climate change to many initiatives uh, within the department. I also want to thank Nova Scotians for showing leadership in how we are the leaders in, in climate change mitigation. We have very aggressive targets that are going to bring us to, 40, to 45 to 50 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2030. That's a leader across this country. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to point out that there is a there is a difference between uh, mitigation of climate change and addressing the issues on a proactive go-forward way, and I don't think uh, at all that this budget is uh, addressing on a go-forward uh, uh, proactive way. In fact, I want to ask again, so I look at this budget, I see two, just over $2 million towards climate change of an $11, million, of, of $11 billion budget. So I'm asking the Minister again, she feels that $2 million of an $11 billion budget is enough to address climate change. The Honourable Minister of the Environment with 20 seconds. Yeah, I, I thank the Honourable Member for the question. I, I, I'm afraid he wasn't listening earlier when the Premier actually spoke to the same issue, you know, highlighting $23 million in this budget towards climate change initiatives. You know, Mr. Mr. Speaker, you know, this House has is, is seen... Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We'll now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes the government business for today. As disappointing as it is, Mr. Speaker, we'll be back tomorrow. I move that the House do now rise to sit again tomorrow, Wednesday, March 27th, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 5.30 p.m., and with tomorrow, of course, being a traditional opposition day, I ask the House Leader for the official opposition to call tomorrow's agenda. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the uh, Honourable House Leader of the Government side of the House. Um, after daily routine and question period, we'll be calling bills for second reading. We'll be calling uh, Bill Number 107, the House of Assembly Act, an act to amend respecting committees, and Bill Number 117, an act to amend the Adoption Information Act. The motion oh. now rise to meet again tomorrow at the prescribed hour. <laughs> Motion is for the House to adjourn to rise again tomorrow, Wednesday, March 27th, at the prescribed hour of 1 p.m.
Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The House now stands adjourned till tomorrow at the prescribed hour of 1 p.m.